All right. So, good morning, all. Um, thank you um, for joining. Can you just uh, raise a finger if you can hear me? A nice a thumb, rather. Don't raise a finger. That would be wrong. Um, thanks. Okay. Um, we've still got a few people joining, but uh, it's uh, it's just gone twelve now. So I think we'll we'll start with some of the uh, introductory. Uh, remarks. Thank you very much um, for joining. A warm welcome. We've got uh, 29 people registered to attend, of which we've got half um, on board now. So I suspect we'll get a few more who uh, who sweep in late, and there may be a couple who join during the day for particular um, particular phases. I haven't had uh, any anguished messages in the last 20 minutes saying they're struggling to get in. So uh, so hopefully any technical hitches that. Um, we had have been resolved. Uh, so I'm just going to start with a bit of an introduction about uh, what we're doing. Um, and uh, I'll, to do that, I will um, share the screen um, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll go on from there. So uh, I hope you find the afternoon of use. So uh, just a very int short introduction um, to me. I'm a, a sailor, a soldier, and uh, and a garden lover. And uh, just if you focus on that uh, that garden, um, just to tell you a brief story, uh, that's uh, an image. That's my um, walk to work in Lashkagar in Helmand Province a few years ago. And uh, those of you with sharp eyes can see the Hesco Bastion Wall um, in the distance there. Um, and one of the things I did on that particular tour um, was to blog about that garden, um, which was maintained by an Afghan local whose sole job was uh, making this wonderful garden spring out um, from the desert. And for those who went out on the ground patrolling every day, for those who only came into Lashkagar occasionally, or for those like myself who spent the majority of their time in the camp, it really did make a, a huge difference um, to morale and the well-being of everyone. And I used to write about this, um, rather than sending blueies to family and friends, I maintained a private um, a private blog, which was my first experience of blogging, um, and that's how I kept in touch with people, and it was, this photo is taken from that private blog. Um, so now I'm the Director of Rural Link, which includes uh, Rural Link Veteran, um, which is building sustainable career pathways into uh, land-based careers for service leavers at key points of their careers. We offer free coaching and support to individuals. However, our main aim is to work with employers to advocate for service leavers and generate a sustainable, accessible demand for ex-forces employees across the sector. We believe service leavers self-categorise as either career seekers when they know they'll be leaving the service, but have yet to identify a follow on career and career developers when they are specifically targeting an industry or even a role. Um, both are in the audience today. Um, even the presenters are probably still um, career developers and it may be something that's with you your whole life. Um, if you feel like it, you know, have a think about which you are and you can familiarize yourself with the chat. Um, by perhaps putting a comment in there as to which you think you are. And that'll help us to make sure that we um, make our comments uh, bias to the type of audience um, we have. Some service leavers, many in fact, are very focused on just getting that first job. Um, some have not allowed sufficient time or may not have been able to find sufficient in-depth access to build a realistic picture of the jobs market. And some will grasp at the first role they see, which they can do, um, which may turn out not to be the right place. But it's a it's a what I call a gateway job. Others call um, a landing spot um, to get out into um, their new careers. What I want to do is support individuals by informing and inspiring them about this sector. And that is what today is all about. Rural Link Veterans runs Rural Career Insight Days every three months, either at physical locations around the country or online, where resettling personnel can find out more about careers on the land, in the land-based sector. We also work with employers across the sector to establish sustainable, supported pathways into follow-on careers. We advocate for ex-military personnel, and we have a growing network of forces-friendly employers 
many of whom are veterans themselves, keen to employ service leavers. You can catch up on previous editions and register for future events or subscribe to keep in touch at ruralink.org.uk. This slide on transferable values is a mnemonic um, of the values that service leavers bring to the rural sector. And for the non-military delegates, I should explain that military education is full of such catchy ways to remember otherwise impenetrable facts. And, uh, and so service people are, are very happy um, with mnemonics. Um, I've, uh, I've built it into um, the word farmers, and I'll just spend a little bit of time explaining it. If you're um, an employer or a trainer, um, I hope these resonate because it's built on what um, farming businesses and others in the sector have said they look for um, from any employee and sometimes struggle to find. And if you're a service person who's um, going through resettlement or looking to potentially move into the land-based sector, if you can build a story around each of these qualities, you'll be well equipped for filling in application forms, writing cover letters, um, and certainly for talking um, in interviews. So formable, what do we mean by formable? Well, this means trainable, but also able to adjust um, yourself slightly into the culture, the working culture where you find yourself. Um, and of course, service people who are used to moving jobs every couple of years or for operational tours, moving into new teams to do jobs that are very different from what they were doing a few weeks ago, are very used to forming them themselves into something a little bit different, developing themselves and improving themselves. When we as military folk turn up in a new role, we expect to start performing and delivering within um, days, perhaps certainly within weeks. What we don't expect to do is sit around for six months to a year supposedly learning um, and that's why gateway jobs are so important um, to use the skills that we already have and to to be expected then to learn the 20 or 30 percent of a new role which may be sector awareness that we don't have so service people are really up for that um, and and those of you who are in your resettlement don't underestimate the value that has that you are formable because you are used to moving um, roles um, service people are also um, hugely adaptable, can move, um, as I say, anywhere, but also when something goes wrong, something changes, it's a bit of a crisis, um, it's the serviceman or woman who's going to keep themselves calm and look for the opportunities um, in whatever that is. Something changes, it'll be the ex-military person who, who is forward-thinking, forward-looking um, and trying to adapt and usually succeeding. Service people are reliable, they turn up on time more or less with the right kit, the right equipment, they've thought about what they're going to do um, and you can depend on them turning up. And when they do turn up, they're meticulous. Army folk call this attention to detail. Submariners talk about remembering to close the hatch and so you won't find them with their pockets open. Um, meticulous um, people that look at the detail as well as the bigger picture. Service people are energetic, they're keen to get stuck in. Energetic also includes enthusiastic. They want something to be successful and they're going to throw themselves and expect to be in a team um, that is similarly energetic. And if they're not, they'll do their very best to generate that energy across the team. They're robust, not too scared of rain, though they would like the right clothing these days um, and, uh, and will get on whatever the, uh, whatever the adverse conditions are. Um, and perhaps the biggest attribute that service people have grown up with is selflessness, um, where they put the, um, need, the needs of the team first, perhaps to a fault. And again, one of the most difficult things service people um, find when they're entering the civilian um, jobs market is actually saying, I did this, um, when they're talking about um, examples from their military career, rather than we did this. Um, and that is the thing that most people need a bit of coaching with is identifying what their individual contribution was to the team. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and being selfless is a, is a really great um, attribute across um, all professions, uh, really. Um, but one has to find the balance of saying, the team did this and my contribution was this part of it. So, uh, so with that, um, 
I'm going to uh, then talk about uh, today's uh, programme. It's split into uh, six sessions, each with a 10 minute break between them. Apart from this introductory session and the next steps piece at the end, each will feature three presenters whose contributions are intended to provide a, um, a range of perspectives on that subject. Each session will conclude with a discussion panel in which delegates are very welcome to ask questions. If you prefer to type your question into the chat box, please do so, and I'll ask it on your behalf. Um, however, if you wish to ask your question yourself, either indicate that in the chat or simply switch your camera on, and I shall invite you to make your contribution. Could I now ask everyone to again check that they have their microphones muted and video feeds switched off? Um, and uh, please also note that I'm recording this event um, as it will later be available to watch back on the Rural Link channel on YouTube. Presenters, please be aware that I've enabled screen share for all. So please ensure that if you are using uh, PowerPoint or another um, document that you want to share, have it open on your desktop before you come to speak in order that it's available to share when you start to speak. Um, so with all of that, um, let's um, move on. Already slightly ahead of time, my words, that's, uh, that'll soon disappear. Um, so I'm, I'm now delighted um, to, to open the first session um, in which our three speakers are from National Farmers Union Scotland, Joint Force Alba, and um, Lantra. And between them, they'll provide the context for land based careers in Scotland at this time. I first met Rupert Shaw in a desert some time ago, some many years ago, um, and it's been a real pleasure to uh, reconnect with him in recent years. A former infantryman. Uh, Rupert has established his own farm, Gled Park, which we'll hear more about in, uh, in later on. Um, but he's opening this conference in his capacity as honorary treasurer of uh, NFU Scotland. Before rising to the national executive, he was a regional representative and has also been involved in other representational roles across the industry. He's also hosted resettling personnel on his farm, so he understands the issues um, that uh, resettlers face from many perspectives. Rupert, thank you very much for um, opening this conference with your talk on food production futures. Over to you. Thank you, Fiona, and uh, hello, everyone. I was very struck by the requirement to inspire and inform, so I hope you're all going to be relieved that, uh, A, this isn't going to be the Rupert Shaw show. I'll just quickly say I was in from 1988 to 2012. Soldiering was my first love. But in the eight years that I've been out, I feel that, uh, you know, I've really uh, had opportunities in this industry because it's an industry with very much an open door. And if you remember nothing else that I say today, uh, think about that. This is an industry desperate for your contribution and your participation. So in terms of the inspiration, uh, I'm not going to blind you with a load of little facts and figures or all the sort of leaflets and the stuff you can get out there. I plan on doing a few so what's for you. The first thing I want you to think about is the importance of food production in all senses in Scotland. The Scottish Government have declared an ambition to grow the value of our food and drink sector to 30 billion pounds by 2030. Just consider that for a second. That is going to require quite an upscaling in our primary production because current values were at about 14 billion. So think of that, a declared ambition to get us to 30 billion. And for me, just that as a headline, uh, points into everything I'm gonna say. The political importance of agriculture in Scotland is not just uh, government context. It really is a reflection of the true fabric of, of Scotland. 67,000 people are currently directly employed in agriculture. But when you look at rural Scotland, I, you look outside the central belt, 
i.e. the vast majority of this country. Agriculture is the third largest employer in rural areas after the service and public sectors. And there are many areas like where I live in Galloway, where really it is, it is farming pretty much the only gig uh, that's on. And uh, so what? Why have I opened with that? Well, there is no MP, there's no MSP, there's no one really responsible in terms of Scotland's future uh, direction of travel who are going to ignore agriculture, those involved with it, or those real perceived uh, and possible threats to that and its fabric as part of Scotland. So I'll give you an example of this because it's easy for me to say that, isn't it? It's easy to throw out those big openers. Well, a very early reality check for me was in 2014, only two years into my farming career, but already the vice chairman of the Legal and Technical Committee within the NFU, when there was a problem with the farm subsidy payment system in Scotland. And the NFU, which represents 9,000 businesses of the 17,000 agricultural holdings that exist in Scotland, declared that because of the failure to pay out the EU subsidy to members uh, and those in agriculture across Scotland, it was going to mount a demonstration outside Holyrood. Just having announced that, the night before the planned demonstration, the Scottish Government brought in a loan scheme, which is still going six years later, i.e. desperate to keep farmers on side, put money into farm businesses, uh, despite, you know, existing problems with the dispersal of money through a computer system and the rest of it. And I think for me, as someone who'd certainly been the other side of demonstrations and the rest of it in various places, I mean, this is really quite significant. To be involved in an industry, to be involved in an activity where that uh, need to please it, that need to support it, is right at the forefront of our policy makers. So why is that then? Uh, agriculture is fully devolved in Scotland. And, you know, I've just talked about subsidies and the importance of it. It's previously been about 491 million pounds. The so what of that is that it's seen as a way of backing a winner. So I'm gonna talk about whiskey briefly, even if you know nothing about farming or even less about agriculture. If you know anything about Scotland, you'll know about whiskey. Now I'm not, uh, I'm not one of the anti-gin brigade, et cetera, but I will still put my head above the parapet and say is whiskey is really what we're known for. There are 133 operating distilleries currently in Scotland. Whiskey is still the number one internationally traded spirit in the world. One third by cash value of all exports to the EU are whiskey. And what does that whiskey rely on? Barley. And of course, going forward, just remember this, all these ambitions, I talked about the 30 billion pound goal, I've laid it out with the whiskey. Right down at farm level, everything happening on farms, crofts, in estates, is seen as absolutely critical to that direction of travel. So going forward, agriculture is a key industry. But what else are we hearing about in the news? What else are people concerned about? Climate change, I would imagine, would be on a few people's lips. And a lot of people will think, oh, well, that's bad news for agriculture, etc." Well, not at all. Agriculture is unique, really, in that, of course, many farms, like my own, supply food, but it also stores carbon. And it's also a site of renewable energy generation. Inevitably, 
Land holdings mean space for, in my case, solar panels on barn roofs and a wind turbine. There are, of course, numerous other strands to farms. And of course, uh, it's great to see Frieda on the list there. There are a lot of farms very successfully diversified into agritourism uh, and all sorts of bits and pieces. But fundamentally, and I think the COVID experience from my perspective uh, has really reinforced that. What is the one thing that has not been affected in my farming business throughout the severe stages of early lockdown and the rest of it? It was the ability to put livestock into the food chain. I won't need to tell any of you listening that there are a lot of things you can decide that you might do and you might not do. There are a lot of savings you might decide to make. There are a lot of lifestyle choices you might consider. But I guarantee one thing, you've all eaten today and you'll plan on eating tomorrow. Now that of course doesn't provide a golden ticket for any particular farm business. Uh, it is after all about producing what customers want. And I'm sure we'll go on to that later. There are plenty of examples now in Scotland, not just your beef and sheep and dairy enterprises, but people are growing tea, et cetera, et cetera. So conscious of the time, uh, a bit of the inform now. Saying you want to get into agriculture, uh, and I often get the old telephone call, is a bit like saying to someone who's serving, oh, I want to be an army soldier. Too vague an aspiration. Not only are there no two farms the same, uh, no two crofts the same, but there is such a rich diversity of opportunity within agriculture. There's every aspect that you can imagine. So on the informed side, for those who are considering uh, what bit of agriculture you want to get into, I think you have a key decision point to make right at the beginning. And this is what I spent a lot of time thinking about before I got out. And I want you to consider this as your kind of takeaway. Where will you settle? The bottom line is in life, you will have to decide, and you've had experience of that in the military, are you gonna fight for a place or be placed? But fundamentally in land-based businesses and in a Scottish context, where you decide to settle will shape specifically those opportunities that come your way. As in, if you don't study uh, aircraft mechanics or get involved in that, you're not gonna be fixing helicopter engines. 85% of Scotland's land mass is less favored areas. That's actually an EU designation. It talks about how difficult the land is. Some of you who uh, holiday back home and the rest of it, as I always did, know that it's rather enjoyable that we have miles and miles of bugger all. But it's quite different holidaying in miles and miles of bugger all and trying to make a living from it. So more specifically, I've already mentioned Scotland has 17,000 holdings. And that again is a mix of crofts, farms and estates. The largest number of that 17,000 is up in the Northwest, but they are significantly smaller in terms of the stock they can support and the area of cropping land. So sheep farming predominates fundamentally in the Northwest. For similar reasons, many holdings in the Southern Uplands are sheep. Large cereal farms are concentrated in the east of the country. Beef throughout, though there are huge differences in scale between the sort of crofter with five or 10 cattle and a unit near me, for example, which finishes two and a half thousand bull beef animals a year. And in the southwest, for example, the majority of Scotland's only 900 or so dairy farms are with 25% of all its cattle. So why do I lay all that out? If your aspiration is to drive a big combine harvester on tracks, 
with your air conditioning and your Bluetooth enabled and your satellite steering, you are not going to do that on one of the islands. You must be realistic. You must realize that farming is still very much dependent on the weather, the climate, the topography. So again, that decision point about where you want to settle is going to shape those opportunities. Horticulture is another good example. Yes, if you're going to go it alone, of course, you could, you know, put up a polytunnel anywhere. But a key so what when considering location, especially if you want to go it on your own, is where is your market? How easy is the access to market? Here in the southwest, I have a cattle market in Newton Stewart, 15 miles one way, and I have a cattle market in Castle Douglas, 20 miles the other way. I'm in an area where the scale of farming is such that there is a good agricultural cooperative, Tar Valley, which means I can get everything I want for my own farming business at a reduced rate because Tarf's annual turnover just amongst its Southwest farmers is 177 million pounds. So again, think realistically about that point. Where are you going to settle? and shape your business. When I come on to my own farm presentation, understanding where you are in the world and how that will affect and reflect the opportunities available to you is key. The more flexible you can be on where you settle, the more opportunities you'll have. However, it was in my case where I was returning uh, to the home range as it were, and I'm sure in lots of yours, one of the appeals of leaving the military is domestic stability. So accept that point now, if you are going back home, if you know where you're going to settle, curb, uh, you know, the aspirations or focus them more. Uh, I want to just pick up on the skill set that Fiona mentioned at the beginning. Uh, this is going to sound a little harsh to all of you who aren't ex-military and the rest of it, but reliability out here in the real world, as my brother and sister, who both run their own companies, used to say to me while I was still serving, out here in the real world, uh, reliability is hard to come by. If you can turn up in the right place at the right time with the kit required, wow, you are so far ahead of many of the workforce. If you're not bothered by the weather, if you've got an ability to listen, to adapt, to get on with things, this is an industry that's crying out. I can't say more than the fact that I've only been farming for eight years. I started a farming journey eight years ago with no livestock of my own and no worthwhile fences. And uh, I'm here very much on the merits of the business I've built. Think about having a blended portfolio when you first start out. That's been key to my success. Think realistically about the skill set you got in the military. I have to admit my dear enterprise does reflect my military background a bit more than other bits and pieces. You know, use of a high powered rifle is absolutely part of my field to fork deer enterprise. Think about audit work. I'll mention it later on, but I'm an auditor for Lloyd's Register of the Scottish Quality Wild Venison Scheme. Any of you who've instructed a subject in the military, all of you, because of the levels of continuous professional development and the rest of it, uh, a lot of that kind of activity will seem like money for old rope. And my final thought on the inform is really choose a good mentor. Uh, it's something I never took seriously in the military. Uh, but I've realized uh, it's so much more important when you're no longer in an or organization that is a meritocracy. Uh, the business world is more complicated and choose that mentor carefully. Choose someone who's made the journey that you want to make. Choose people who are doing what you aspire to do. Choose them very carefully and you know, gain either work with them uh, 
or look for the work you want to do or another holding and help make that decision there. Because my final thought in terms of the context of agriculture in Scotland now, the average age of a farmer in Dumfries and Galloway is 58. I left Colchester at the age of 42, thinking I was, you know, the old man there, et cetera, felt my age. Everyone was sort of, you know, half of it. I arrived in Dumfries and Galloway and everyone went, who is this young man? You know, remember that average age of 58 is a reflection of the fact that there are a lot of farmers who are actually well into their 70s. There are people my age on family holdings who, a bit of a caricature, I'm afraid, haven't got their hands on the checkbook yet. Your physical robustness, your mental flexibility, your determination to get on with it, provide opportunities for you that some of these folk don't have. This is an industry with a strong future. I laid that out right at the beginning. It's a strong future because of the inevitable human demand for food and because of political commitment. This is an industry desperate for committed talent and you are talented. So only you will limit the opportunities that you have going forward. Fiona, that's me. Rupert, thanks ever so much. And to excuse the pun um, for a very protein rich haha, um, opener. Um, and uh, here comes another one um, with lots of food for thought. Um, what uh, um, I think we've done there really successfully, thank you so much, Rupert, is frame the day. And I'll just emphasize um, a couple of points. Um, and I might ask you to just comment a bit further in a moment, Rupert, about um, the value of a mentor since we've got a couple of minutes. But before I ask you to do that, um, just to, to amplify the point about a blended portfolio, um, that's what I do. Um, it's what Rupert has said he does, and you'll find that there are plenty of people on this call who are doing something similar. Um, and it sounds scary when you've been in what you think is one job, perhaps for, for two or more decades, um, but actually, all that means is that on one day of the week, you perhaps are instructing on something that you know very well. And perhaps for that part of your life, you're self-employed. And that sounds a bit scary as well. But again, all that means is that you invoice for the time you spend doing on that work and you employ an extortionate but manageable cost an accountant to add it all up for you. Um, at the end of the year, and I'm still reeling because I got my accounts back last night. Um, the uh, uh, So having a blended portfolio where you do two or three different things, what that does for you um, in this resettlement period is it um, covers your risk, um, perhaps very important in 2020, 2021, so that if something doesn't work, the other one or two things you're doing um, may lead on to other things and you may then go into one of those where you've established yourself you may discover you don't enjoy one of the one of the parts of your portfolio and so when you're financially able to you can drop that but of course when you're starting off in a new career it also accelerates your ability to build your network and to discover what else is out there in the sector um, so those are a few of the reasons why I would say a blended portfolio is really worth um, doing. And maybe other speakers will will talk about it. Um, and I can think of a couple who probably will as we go through the day. Now, on mentoring, um, perhaps, Rupert, you could just perhaps give a couple of examples, either as a mentor yourself, which I'm sure you are now, or a mentee. Just you know, a few concrete ideas about what that relationship does for both parties, actually. <laughs> Uh, well, for me, the, the mentoring piece is really about acknowledging what, what you don't know. So I have selected a, and I literally mean it, I selected him. I selected one of the local farmers who, you know, for me has, has actually achieved. I, in simple terms, he started in the 70s with about 400 acres, which isn't a bad start, I'm sure. But he's now at 1300 acres, he's got a mixed unit, he's got a mixed portfolio of sort of, you know, properties and gatehouse, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And he is, you know, someone who's clearly made his money from farming, uh, a direction of travel and the rest of it. 
And the reason I lay it out in those bold terms is because there's no shortage of people wanting to offer you advice when they know that you've not been farming and you've just taken it over. One of my other neighbors, by contrast, his father had 15 farms uh, and he's down to living on one of them. So in a quite sort of brutal way, that's what I mean about select, selecting your mentor. You know, I, I am in farming at the small scale because it's all I could stretch myself to on a mortgage in the, in the sort of real world and the rest of it. But in terms of sort of aspiration and direction of travel, uh, <clears throat> you know, I wanted someone that I could, you know, bounce ideas off and then be so out of my league that they wouldn't feel at all feared of, you know, uh, seeing me of competition and the rest of it. And so my mentor is absolutely fantastic. You know, I ask him various things about, should I sell this? What should I do with that? Should I spend money on the other? And I know that the answers I get from him uh, are worth having. Because I'm afraid when you go into business, spending money is the easy bit and actually a ruthless control of costs, not wasting a single penny on what you don't need to do, while maximizing the return available on everything else that is an asset is, is key. And I, I didn't grow up in the army having to do that. Uh, you know, pretty much on my whole journey, if, uh, if we kept complaining about it, eventually someone might sort it out. It might've taken a few years to uh, recognize that, you know, Gore-Tex might be a handy thing or, you know, it took a few more years to realize that the SA-80 had numerous faults, but ultimately uh, we, were, we were supported in that way. When you're in business, you are on your own. Mm. And so it's very important to find someone that isn't a competitor, has made the journey successfully, and is at a stage of their life where they're happy to psychologically, as it were, keep pointing you in the right direction. But mentoring is one thing. Mentoring will only work if you make the effort to ask truthful questions in the first place and do something about the truthful answers you get. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And um, Freda has made um, an excellent point um, in the chat just to amplify the points. The average age of farmers um, is 58. Um, and you talk about their frustrated next generation who... Uh, who haven't got their hands on the checkbook, but of course many have um, got a frustrated um, next generation who don't intend to get anywhere near the farm and actually uh, don't have a succession plan and may therefore be looking to share the load. Um, and so share farming and, and who knows where that might go um, and who better of course than a, an enthusiastic and energetic, hardworking service lever um, to come in and take on um, the load of, of, of farming. So thank you, Frida. That's a really excellent point um, and rounds off um, that uh, fantastic opener really well. Rupert, thanks. That's brilliant. And we look forward to, to hearing your perspective from your farm um, a bit later on. Thank you. So we'll move on now um, to um, Emma Davis, um, who I met um, also on operations, but um, in a different desert. Um, She's blogged uh, about her experiences as a reservist intelligence officer and the pressures of returning to civilian and family life after um, that particular operational tour, as well as more generally on moving on from um, military life. Her civilian career has been in HR throughout, though, and so when the time came for her to establish her own business, she opted to use both those skill sets and open what remains the only ex-military recruitment specialist in Scotland. Emma, thank you very much um, for joining us um, and to give us an overview of the employment market in Scotland. And thanks too for adjusting uh, your remarks in light of uh, the latest COVID policies uh, announced really in the last um, few hours. Um, I think you're gonna take control of the screen, which you're very welcome to do. Um, and it's over to you, Emma. A very warm welcome. Thank you very much, Fiona, and good to see you again. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, I know most of you got cameras off, um, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to see me okay. I have done um, some slides for this presentation. It's not that there's massive amounts of, of data or information that I want you to process, but just helps um, illustrate some of the points that um, I'm looking to make. So 
uh, in good fashioned technology. Let's see if I can get this to work for me. Okay, You've got a full slide. Thank you, Fiona. <laughs> I did this the other day and it completely forgot to share, and I was just um, I, I was just chatting away and, and, and didn't get that information across. Um, so yes, uh, obviously Fiona has given most of the introduction, but what I'm I'm looking to do today is give a very much a situation in general overview of the um, jobs and employment market in Scotland, and obviously speakers that are following on today are going to provide much more specific insights, um, as indeed Rupert did um, as in his introduction just then as well, as to more specific pieces about um, employment and jobs market within the, the agricultural and, and rural sectors. Um, but in terms of um, this current situation, obviously COVID has had quite a massive impact on the jobs market. Um, what I wanted to show you here is really looking at how um, jobs have changed uh, over the, the, the last eight, nine months or so. Um, we saw that recruitment essentially sort of fell off a bit of a cliff, generally speaking, in March. Um, and I saw that within Joint Force Alba as well. Um, but there has been a steady increase happening um, really since then. Um, but uh, as Fiona alluded to, that, that pace of change has been such that we've seen some dramatic changes in the employment market, um, some of which has literally been overnight. And, and the move for a lot of um, people in, in office-based roles to home working and remote working is a prime sort of example of that. Um, but more specifically, we've also seen a dramatic change in the sort of distribution of roles. So obviously certain sectors have been hit particularly hard, so tourism, um, uh, retail and, and, and leisure industries, whereas others have actually done, um, have come out of this quite well. So the IT and tech sector and social care, and the reason I um, wanted to show this one is looking at the food and, and drink process operatives. And when we were looking at that overall sort of um, stream of where that sort of rural and, and agricultural sector can sort of move into, clearly as, as Rupert was alluding to, food and drink is, is one of those key sectors. Um, but alongside that, there's been quite a sort of geographical um, uh, myth distribution, I suppose. Um, so certain uh, sort of towns, cities and areas have really struggled. Um, Aberdeen and Edinburgh actually have struggled probably most than the likes of, of Glasgow, Stirling uh, and Dundee. Aberdeen has suffered a particular sort of double whammy, both dealing with, with the effects of COVID that everybody has, but then also the subsequent knock-on effect on the, the oil price, um, which has obviously severely impacted the recruitment in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire uh, with that, that sort of distribution um, moving along to that as well. So when it came to actual um, job postings within Aberdeen, it slumped by, uh, you know, sort of nearly 75% sort of and Edinburgh was almost half um, what it was um, uh, compared to sort of the, the late end of 2019. That was literally only a, only a couple of weeks ago, and I thought that was quite sort of appropriate. Um, but in terms of the UK job posting trends, and I'll look more specifically uh, at Scotland shortly, um, is what you can see is the dramatic job that we had right at the start and that steady rise that we saw over the summer. Um, and what we're seeing at the moment is that actually job postings are marginally higher uh, in October than they were during March, uh, which is positive news, but they are plateauing slightly. Um, and you can see that sort of replicated um, in Scotland, albeit Scotland as a region is actually recovering better than the likes of London um, and southeast of England, um, which is a wee bit odd. Normally you see actually that, that London tends to lead the way either when things go wrong, it tends to be the one that you recognise that in first, but when there's a recovery, London tends to be the one that picks up first. So that's quite an anomaly, particularly in comparison to other sort of economic shocks to the system. Um, and in terms of uh, the graph I've got on the left here, that's really looking at uh, sort of more generic sort of recruitment agencies. And um, you've got two different colours there. The sort of darker blue is looking at permanent uh, jobs and the, the lighter blue teal colour is looking at temporary placements. And the reason I want to highlight that is to show that actually what we're seeing, yes, some of the permanent placements have come back up, but it's, it's very fluctuating, whereas the temp side has actually sort of been much more sustained. Um, since the summer months. And I think what that goes to demonstrate is that there is still um, an unease in the jobs market at the moment. But although we've had some positivity over the summer, um, a lot of organisations have not got that confidence yet to really fully commit to sort of full on permanent jobs. But they've got work to do. And so they're looking at, at sort of the temp market to support that. 
And I think we're going to see that increase over the rest of Q4, um, certainly with the sort of Christmas bounce that, that hopefully we're going to get. Um, we've got a lot of folk in um, uh, sort of grocery retail and the delivery uh, side of things, and obviously online retail, who are actually ramping up their operations. Um, post office, for example, taking on a record number of temps this season um, to, 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 to deal with the anticipated increase um, in uh, postal and, and delivery services. Um, but the short answer is there are sort of less jobs on offer, but that's only one side of the coin. The other side really is looking at um, the amount of people that are looking for work. So you, again, you've kind of got a bit of a double um, whammy into this. Um, and the, the article headline on the right hand side there is, uh, OK, it's, it's bar staff work. Um, but, you know, when, when hospitality was uh, slightly more open over the summer months and we had the, the eat out to help out scheme, then actually job postings for the likes of bar staff waitressing, et cetera, um, shot up quite quickly, um, but then they were inundated with applications. Um, so the competition for jobs is, is vastly increased um, as uh, businesses have seen more of a headcount reduction um, over the last uh, eight months or so. Um, so that might be a bit doom and gloomy, um, but there is uh, obviously some positives come out of it. So what are we looking at that's gonna be coming up next? Um, well, as Fiona alluded to, changing COVID restrictions have really um, been hampering a lot of organisations. Um, and I suppose as an example of that, I actually first started drafting this presentation back in the end of October. Um, and pretty much every time I've gone back to, to work on it, I've almost had to sort of tear it up and start again because the, the pace of change has been, has been such. Um, uh, and obviously we've had different changes across Scotland as well with Glasgow in the West um, moving into the highest level of restrictions in tier four, um, whereas the likes of East and Midlothian actually moving down uh, into tier two. And obviously it being different again, up and towards the Highlands and uh, the Northern Isles as well. Um, we've also got IR35 inbound. Um, and what this is, is primarily dealing with the contractor market. Um, but what we're going to see with that is, uh, and we started to see it at the beginning, at the tail end of last year and the beginning of this year, before um, IR35 regulations were, were delayed for 12 months. Um, and what that's going to do is have a bit of an impact on the contractor market. So whereas people might have gone it alone um, and set up sort of limited companies, one-man bands, um, and gone uh, sort of out on day rates with organisations, that's going to become a bit more challenging um, in terms of uh, what we've seen in, in the past. So again, that might increase the competition for jobs um, across the sectors. And of course, we've got the good old chestnut of Brexit, um, which is going to come in in uh, supposed to be happening in January, uh, subject to the, um, are we going to have any delays? Um, but of course, we still haven't got a trade deal sorted as yet. And so it's proving a huge amount of uncertainty. And I know the agriculture sector um, uh, in particular with the exports, as Rupert was alluding to for food and drinks, um, is hugely nervous about what Brexit is going to bring. And it's a combination of all this uncertainty, which is really sort of hampering that growth, I think, in, in the jobs market across Scotland. Um, I alluded to the sort of Christmas bounce that we've got at the moment. Typically, we obviously see a lot more consumer spending. Um, and something that I'll, I'll, I'll come on to a little bit um, uh, later is about the impact on the sort of rural uh, side of things, where actually um, we're seeing uh, obviously an increased spending uh, in sort of buying locally um, and, and shopping more locally as well, purely because we can't travel as much. And so people are looking to more um, sort of local retailers um, for their gifts food, produce, um, and things like that as well. But in terms of the rural uh, economy more generally, um, this, uh, this article actually I saw on the BBC yesterday, so I thought it was quite poignant as I, I, I sort of put it in as a point anyway. Um, but what we've seen, uh, particularly with lockdown, um, is that house prices have, have rise, risen more generally, but actually rural properties have been incredibly popular as people have suddenly gone, give me space um, to be outside and have that sort of privacy and uh, uh, without sort of having to negotiate with others in a, in a more urban setting. Um, and actually, I think that will be a positive in terms of if we have got people moving out to more urban and rural areas, and particularly if we see that um, move to uh, remote working stick with a lot of organisations, then actually people's reasons for being in the cities won't necessarily um, be there anymore. And that will hopefully then increase cash flow into those rural economies. But also what we've got is vaccines. Um, so literally within what, the last 10 days or so, we've had uh, two different organisations have some very positive trials uh, with vaccines. Um, and there's already uh, talks that they'll start rolling out vaccines potentially at the tail end of this year and early into Q1. Um, and I think once we get 
a little bit more, more sort of uh, defined timescales on the vaccines, we'll start to see economic activity increase as we see restrictions starting to reduce. Um, and so hopefully, little fingers crossed there, by spring 2021, I think we will start to see a lot more um, uh, sort of economic activity and jobs uh, probably getting back to perhaps close to where they were at the tail end of um, uh, 2019. And hopefully with this sort of time frame, it's actually typically recruitment tends to be busiest in Q2 and Q3, so the sort of slightly better weather months. Um, uh, and that's across sectors, not just limited to the, to the sort of rural uh, and agricultural economies. Um, and so hopefully those factors combined will give that jump start to the, to the jobs market um, that we're looking for. As I say, that was a, a, a whiz across a lot of those uh, uh, sort of general um, employment market across uh, Scotland. Um, I appreciate timing wise, um, it may be prudent to wait for questions sort of slightly later on, but I'll put my contact details in the in the chat as well. And um, so that if any of you want to follow up afterwards, um, feel free to do so. Um, but otherwise, Fiona, thank you very much. Emma, that's that's fantastic. Thank you very much. We, we will um, hold questions until the discussion period just to keep on track. Um, but just as a, a warning, I might ask you if I may, and when we get to that point, uh, just to expand on the significance of IR35. I won't ask you for the huge technical breakdown, but people bandy it about and it's a new term for some. So, um, and of course it does have um, an implication for those who think they might be going into um, consultancy or uh, or related field. So we'll, mm -hmm. we'll perhaps handle that. And also uh, Angus, I've seen your question and Rupert's uh, response in the chat and uh, we'll have an opportunity to discuss that more as we go forward. Um, so let us now turn, thank you very much, to, uh, to Jenny Adamson, um, who is the Policy and Partnerships Coordinator um, with Lantra Scotland. Uh, she works with the Scottish Government on behalf of Lantra to deliver Lantra Scotland's work plan, attracting a diverse range of new talent, influencing learning and training provision and driving investment in learning and skills development. Jenny became a STEM ambassador in 2018 you know what address it was in? and has accumulated over 60 hours of volunteering engagement, showcasing the wide range of opportunities uh, so be, in yeah. land-based aquaculture and uh, um, yeah, well environmental done. conservation roles. I'm so pleased she's here to provide her expert insights on rural employment opportunities today. And Jenny, if you... Uh, uncloak yourself <laughs> hello um, it's uh, very very i'm um, very pleased to welcome you to royal careers insight day thank you very much thank you so much fiona i'm just going to share my screen and then i can get started it's going to slide show now thank you um, yes, yeah, so start off just giving a wee bit about Lantra. So um, Lantra is a charity that exists to ensure that the land based and aquaculture sector can meet its skills needs. So we work in different ways in the different UK nations. Uh, for example, you may have um, I think uh, one of our Lancha Awards colleagues has spoken before at Rural Link uh, presentation about becoming a Lancha instructor or um, a, a assessor. Um, all that's run from our head office in Stoneley and they support the network of approved training uh, providers and instructors. Uh, today I'll be focusing a wee bit more on our work in Scotland, the industries we support here and the opportunities within the sector. Okay, so a bit about Lantra Scotland to begin with. We are funded by the Scottish Government uh, to deliver a work plan, which has three key themes that have popped up there. Um, we promote the positive and, uh, oh, sorry, we uh, promote to businesses the benefits of investing in skills and training. Uh, so that's through business and stakeholder engagement. We do things like create case studies to show the impact that training has had on a business, both on the individual, but also to, to the business overall. We influence learning and training provision. Uh, we make sure that it's fit for purpose. And how we do that is we support the reviews of land-based uh, NOS or national occupational standards. Uh, these are descriptions uh, that 
what people in the sectors um, need to know for the different roles that are um, within the sector. Um, these are the foundations of SVQ qualifications and also apprenticeship frameworks. Um, and how we do that is we make sure that the qualifications and the standards reflect uh, the skills that the, is needed by the industry through consultations. So we work, we work very uh, closely with industry to do that. And uh, promoting the sector as a positive and rewarding career choice to a diverse audience, as Fiona mentioned earlier. Uh, we do that by, um, we attend the Highland Show every year and we have a stand um, at the Highland Show. Um, I've got some pictures there of our um, ALBAs. That's our annual ceremony where we celebrate learners. Um, we recognise and reward their achievements. And uh, we create promotional uh, materials, including our website, um, but we also attend events like today's. So um, a bit about rural opportunities. This is some of the, this is just a poster. It's actually a poster we made for schools, but it's so visual, it's great to use um, in, in any context. But the thing there is all the different industries we, we work with, um, there's so many opportunities within the sector and often the barrier is just not knowing about them. Um, you don't have to come from a land-based background. Uh, a lot of new entrants to the sector are career changers and uh, can come from a variety of different backgrounds and of all ages. Um, it's not considered late into the sector if you come in, in your, as a career changer in your 30s, not at all. The sector values new entrants, uh, as long as you're prepared, as Rupert said earlier, for hard work, um, you know, to, to build up your skills, uh, being dedicated to your new industry, as well as um, having a genuine enjoyment um, for the outdoors and, and the industries that you'd be going into. So businesses in the land-based aquaculture and environmental conservation sectors enhance the quality of life for everyone in Scotland. Increased acknowledgement that land-based activities are key to meeting climate change object objectives. Um, you know, green jobs equals good jobs. Um, we need to be more effective on how we use the land and that's through what's known as integrated land management and that's all the industries working together. Um, we need to do that to meet zero carbon targets. Um, the sector's investing in people to support going forward. Um, you know, we're, we're focusing less on contract work. Um, a lot of the industries that we work with are moving towards permanent opportunities and um, doing a lot more training on the job. So you're not having to go, um, you know, externally, you're doing it while you're working. And um, there's lots of different models for employment um, than have been seen previously in the industry. Uh, so I thought I would just touch on some skills needed in the sector. Um, it's gone through several changes in recent years, which has resulted in uh, a greater demand for highly skilled staff. Um, a lot of these will be transferable skills from careers in the forces. Um, industry consultations have shown that these are a, some of the skills that are needed in the sector are STEM and um, that's often mentioned in lots of different sectors just now which is science, technology, engineering and maths. Um, I've popped here technical and work-based skills. Um, that could be training sp in specific areas such as machinery, I'll, I'll touch on training later. Um, digital and data skills as with most sectors now there's an increase in technology being used and that in turn will produce more data so we need people who can interpret that leadership and management skills um, entrepreneurial skills of course and um, but also the brokering bro brokering excuse me of relationships and um, i mentioned er earlier about the integrated land management it needs joined up thinking between the industries you need people who are engaging and people who can communicate Logistics has been mentioned previously as well by Emma. Um, timber and food drivers and haulage um, is key to the sector and there's many ro uh, roles available there, um, very much about where things should be and when. Uh, so logistics is a growing area and meta skills. Um, that's previously been um, referred to as course skills, numeracy, communication, problem solving, teamworking. So roots into the same sector, uh, I've popped here about um, tickets, you may have heard of before. That's um, legislative uh, training that's needed for uh, legislative um, purposes. It's usually accredited training. I've put up a few um, 
of the training providers there, FISA, NPTC, Lanch Awards, Sitting Guilds, higher levels might be through chartered institutes, but it basically these are all practical training uh, you know, qualifications and these are all things that can make people uh, more employable. Um, they, I've also popped there, that can actually lead to self-employment or contract work as well. Um, that can be linked to machinery rings such as ring link, borders machinery ring, who can um, you know, pair you up with opportunities. It could be across Scotland. Um, really, it's all about getting the training and then getting the experience, um, especially when we're talking about things like machinery or spraying um, in the sector. I've also popped there about entry point roles, uh, job roles. Um, you know, don't um, please consider that. Uh, it might be lower in terms of pay, but not in terms of enjoyment or diversity of the practical work you'll be getting involved with. Um, often when you join an organisation, it can lead to opportunities. It's just about getting your foot in the door and, uh, and then you hear about things internally. Uh, qualifications. Um, we, I've popped there the apprenticeship family, so that could be modern technical or graduate apprenticeships. Um, great way to progress um, through your training while you're in the job, earning while you learn. Um, I don't want you to be put off by the term apprenticeship or modern apprenticeships. In particular, it's not just for school leavers. Um, quite often we find that industry use this as a, um, you know, the, a way of training their employees through uh, as they progress through jobs. Um, PDAs are um, personal development awards, which are available there. And we're seeing a lot more online courses being available now. Uh, simply because, um, you know, distance learning and also COVID has, has seen an increase in the online courses as well. And I've also popped there about volunteering and work experience. Um, you know, especially when we're like looking at things like environmental conservation roles, uh, working outdoors, it might be that people have an interest there but don't have the practical experience to draw on. Um, it's, it, the whole point here is getting that um, getting the uh, consolidation of skills, you're getting that experience. And um, you might hear about training opportunities um, or um, there's a chance to network so that can lead on to jobs. So um, that's still seen in, in our industry as a valid way to, to, to get into job roles. Um, and you'll find out about volunteering and work experience. I know that Rural Link have, um, you know, the, the service that you can use there. Um, things like the conservation volunteers, going to marts, farm markets, um, the, the, you can often hear about different opportunities there. Social media is getting used more by, uh, by some of the bigger companies now as well. So um, obviously a lot of these industries will be talked about in more detail um, by different speakers later on today. But I think the, the, in summary, um, the message from, from today will hopefully be that the land-based aquaculture and environmental conservation sector offers exciting, challenging, rewarding and excellent career progression opportunities. Thank you. What a fantastic summary. Thank you very much, Jenny. That's absolutely what we hope it's uh, uh, what it says. Thank you. Um, and thank you for uh, for giving that um, that very upbeat and fact filled um, tour around the sector. Um, I think we are absolutely seeing that the sector is well placed and uh, all three speakers um, in that section have have emphasised that um, whilst for many this period is very bleak perhaps in this sector um, there are many more opportunities um, it is of course knowing where to look for them um, so um, let us um, go into the discussion phase and perhaps if if Rupert and Emma can um, just uh, uncloak themselves as well um, and uh, and there we go thank you um, so um, Angus did you did you want to to comment further or ask uh, your question um, or have you got the, the answer you wanted in the chat? You're on mute, uh, Angus. So if you just come off yeah. mute. There we go. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, that, that's me uh, on the video, but uh, I'll, I'll come off again. Um, no, I've got uh, answers. Thanks very much. I'll have to, to, to work through it and go and do a bit of... Uh, uh, further investigation. I don't want to take up anyone's time, but it was just to see that uh, whilst we were talking about the, the Scottish government and all the impetus that they're putting into agriculture, which is very encouraging, um, that <clears throat> that actually the subsidies will continue in, in some shape or form into the future, because obviously that's going to uh, have, a, have a massive impact um, on, on farms when we leave the EC, or could, if that doesn't continue. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. 
Um, does anyone else have anything they want to say, whether Rupert or anyone else, just on um, the uh, subsidies? Um, I, I know a lot about the English one, but I don't know much about the Scottish scheme, which, as we've heard, is completely devolved. Is there anything, Rupert, that you think would be worth saying for the general, uh, for, for the general population, as it were? Yeah, I think it's a good uh, it's a good principle in life to uh, you know claim everything you're entitled to. Those of you who are still serving, I trust uh, you know your MMA uh, claims are up to date and the rest of it. And uh, you know when you qualified as a parachutist, you got the extra money each day and the rest of it. Uh, having a business is no different. But what I want to lay out is uh, I have no fears at all about mon uh, public money being put towards agricultural businesses directly and indirectly going forward. And, uh, you know, here's my thought, and I'll go on to it later on. You're not, you're not uh, as someone coming into an industry as I was, just going to start getting free money uh, out, of the, out of the stocks, and I didn't. I was actually excluded from farm subsidies because of EU rules uh, until 2015, because they had this rather odd system that, unless you were farming in uh, 2005, you didn't exist. Now that got rectified in time, but I'll go on to it later. The key is to have a viable biz uh, business proposition. Your key relationship will be a good relationship with a bank and your other professional supporters going forward. Uh, but what I laid out in my answer to Angus is I am seeing at the moment a huge number of Scotland only schemes that bring extra money into the farm a very good example of that is the last one I put down there, the suckler beef calf scheme, only in Scotland, you know. So if you were farming in England or Wales, you know, if you were farming just the other side of the Solway from me on similar land in Cumbria, you don't get a payment for every calf that's born on your holding. I get that. There are all sorts of benefits from farming in Scotland as opposed to farming in Cumbria or Northumberland that are reinforced by direct payment incentives and the other thing is in terms of that landscape which I, I think I laid out you know that political importance of farming there will be other schemes that we don't know about yet and not you know and it was very good to hear Jenny you know laying out Lantra there are all sorts of organizations that do get public money that are all part of that progressing you as an individual as a competent business person uh, and therefore your business going forward. So to end with a JC, uh, sorry, Jay-Z thought, as it were, I am a business man. And think about it in those terms. You know, if you have a viable business proposition, money will come your way, but it's got to be viable to start with. Well, thank you. That's a really good um, perspective. Thank you. Um, and um, the other thing to cover, I think, Emma, if I could just ask you to, to use the last couple of minutes we've got before we take a break, just to give us a little bit of insight into what has changed in tax law and that everyone's banding around as the IR35 um, problem and what it might mean for some of the people on this call. Thank you. Uh, no problem, Fiona. Um, however, I will caveat my response with the fact that I am neither a tax specialist <laughs> yeah. nor a lawyer. Um, I'm coming at this from an HR and an employment yeah. perspective. We, um, we all promise not to sue. <laughs> <laughs> um, so essentially, um, IR35 has actually been around as a piece of legislation since about 2000, um, I believe. Um, and what it did was it was trying to um, stop, I suppose, a loophole in terms of people setting themselves up as a limited company and then essentially doing the work of an employee, but only paying tax as an organisation. So your tax bill essentially was much lower. Um, so what had happened was the original IR35 legislation put the responsibility on the contractor, um, so the individual, to identify whether or not they should be paying employment taxes, so employer, uh, employee tax and national insurance, uh, things like that, um, or whether they were a legitimate company, um, it wasn't disguised employment, uh, and, and therefore they could um, maintain the, the sort of company tax status, so corporation tax um, uh, and things like that. So what has changed is that HMRC have realized that A, they don't have the resources to go after every contractor and, 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 uh, and check their assessments. Um, and B, funnily enough, most a lot of contractors kind of didn't really do it very much. Um, so what they've done is they've changed the, the responsibility to put it on the end user. So the person who is engaging with the contractor. Um, 
And what that means is that the, um, and in a lot of cases, this is larger organizations because they employ contractors to get away from, from having to take on too many permanent employees, which obviously comes with its own risk. Um, but what we saw uh, at the beginning of this year is the likes of some of the big banks. So Barclays um, and Lloyds, for example, they essentially put a blanket ban on all contractors, almost regardless. Um, but that was a bit of a, um, it's quite a sweeping generalization on their part. There are um, circumstances obviously by which uh, a contractor relationship is perfectly legitimate. And what it means in a lot of cases is that people just have to be, and the end user in particular, has to be much more specific about what they are bringing a contractor on to do. And in particular, they're really looking to try and put this down into project-based um, terms rather than what's termed as business as usual. So if I use HR as a, as a, a sort of easy um, example, because that's the one I'm most familiar with, um, maternity cover uh, is quite a common where you might get a contractor in to fill that post for a year or, or whatever. And it's things like that that they're trying to get away from um, and really start to push that if you've got a particular surge because you need to do a load of recruitment or you've got a big uh, employee benefit scheme you might need to put in, that's really where they're thinking that's a genuine contractor relationship, whereas the business as usual is less so. Um, so in terms of the, the, the so what for people as individuals, um, what you are, what you're probably going to see in the market is less contractor opportunities, firstly. Um, secondly, you'll see them stipulated as being either outside IR35, which means carry on as normal, or inside 35. And the implications for that is that you might give a day rate, but what the end user is going to do is take off of that um, estimated uh, or also calculated employment taxes that they then have to send to HMRC on your behalf. So what it then means is that as a contractor, you're not going to get those benefits that you might have had previously. However, one thing that I just want to close with is that HMRC's definition of an employment relationship is different to employment law's definition of an employment relationship. So you might be inside IR35 and have employment taxes taken off you, but that does not necessarily mean that you are then entitled to likes of sick pay, holiday pay, and some of the other benefits of being an employee. So you could be properly um, up a creek without a paddle, um, potentially, if, if, if that's the case. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm no expert. That's it from an employment point of view. Um, there are lots of webinars on it at the moment that you can find online to get more information on this, um, including from HMRC as well. So I'll, I'll leave it there, Fiona. Thanks, thanks Emma. That's, um, that's pretty clear for a non-expert. Thanks very much. Um, one final point before we take uh, a quick 10-minute brief, and that's just to pick up on a point Jenny made um, in, in your presentation, Jenny. Um, you, you mentioned almost in passing ILM integrated land management. Um, and I just wanted to dwell on that just for a moment, um, partly because um, I work quite a lot with an individual who's um, absolutely convinced um, that integrated land management is the way we're going to do land management um, across the country um, in the next 10 to 20 years, and is also convinced and has convinced me, and therefore we're working together to advance opportunities that this is a really rich seam of work for service leavers. Um, integrated land management means slightly different things to different people, but all the words have weight. Um, integrated means that if you take a piece of land or a parcel of land and look around its neighbours, that parcel of land may have different interests. It'll have one ultimate owner, but it may have um, way leaves over it, it may have water flowing through it. The neighbours um, of uh, in quite a small area may be public or private and engaging the community that controls whether that's a cat water catchment or um, an area that's farmed in a particular way and therefore has common interests or a larger forestry block or whatever is the activity that's going on on that land can be very complex. And the project I'm involved with in Gloucestershire, but that we hope will have um, national um, reach, is to look at how you convene or facilitate the integrated management of that land. And that is called ILM and that terminology, it's delightful to hear it repeated back um, by Jenny, um, is spreading across the country. And of course, the soft skills of convening meetings, influencing people, encouraging people to work together with just enough technical knowledge um, to keep up with them is something that an awful lot of military folk can bring. Um, so there are opportunities coming in ILM. So a term to remember 
and perhaps look out for. Um, Rupert, Jenny, um, Emma, thank you so much for opening with what has been a really detailed and, and fact-filled um, and exhausting hour just to get us going. Um, so we'll have a 10 minute break now and come back um, uh, as near to 20 past as we can. Uh, and then we'll have uh, three success stories um, from uh, three service leavers who'll tell them, tell us a little bit of their personal stories of, of how they got into the land-based sector and perhaps a few lessons learned. So I'll just share the screen and we'll mute and I'll see you at 20 past. Thank you very much, everyone. It's been fantastic. Okay, so um, that was a very quick um, 10 minutes. 
and uh, hopefully people are starting to uh, to come back. Um, so where we're uh, where we're headed now is to uh, to welcome uh, Willie Routledge, um, who is a former naval officer. Hello, Willie. Hi, Fiona. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Hang on. I've just got my IT consultant helping me here. I can see her. Double click. And then press the, and then press share. And then they can see this now. Yep. There you go. Why don't you leave it like yeah. that? And then I'll just introduce you and then you're ready to go, Willie. That's fantastic. And now they can see you on the screen. Yeah. Okay then, yeah, I'm happy with that. If you like. Okay. So uh, welcome to Willie. Um, and to his uh, so little helper, um, <laughs> welcome to Willie Routledge, who's a formal naval, former naval officer who now works as a ghillie on a private estate. Um, I know from previous Insight days that one of the most valuable sources of inspiration and confidence to resettling personnel is hearing from those who've made a success of their follow-on careers already. In this session, therefore, Willie and then those who follow on will give uh, an insight into what they do in their day-to-day -day working lives, as well as offering insights into how they got there and maybe um, some reflection on how they do it again um, if they had their time again. Willie, I'm, I'm so delighted you agreed to take part. Um, thank you. Um, away you go. Okay, thanks very much, Fiona. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, thanks for that introduction. I'm Lieutenant Commander Willie Rutledge, retired, and uh, I'm a ghillie to the Duke of Northumberland, the Percy family. Um, or to be politically correct, down in the borders, we refer to Gillies as uh, boatmen. Um, I left the Royal Navy in 2013 after 34 years of service. Um, and having served that time, I left with an immediate pension. I only bring that up because I'll refer to it later on. Um, when I went on my resettlement course, I didn't know what to do. And I listened to people and I could hear them saying they wanted that £50,000 a year job, that £60,000 a year job. And uh, when it came to my turn, I always said I was going to feed my chickens. Um, and the logic there being that I was going to do something that I loved, uh, not because I had to do it. Um, and if I didn't get a job with a, a high income, I would just uh, cut my cloth uh, accordingly. Um, however, as you'll hear in a bit, I, uh, I did get a bit of a lucky break. I'm currently self-employed, um, and that's quite important. However, this year has been a unique year because of COVID and circumstances is, uh, where I work. So um, that might change next Thursday. I might not be um, self-employed. I might find myself as an employee. Um, just a little bit of background. Uh, the River Tweed, where I work down in the borders, 97 miles long, flows through the Scottish borders and a little bit of England. And it's split into sections. These sections are referred to as beats. And the beats are owned by riparian owners. And it's the riparian owner that you work for as a, as a ghillie. Um, the season on the River Tweed runs from the 1st of February to the 30th of November. Now that seems like a long year. However, due to weather and the lack of fish, uh, February, March is very quiet. I'll probably have five or six clients each month, uh, no more than that. And November is, is similar. And in fact, next year, we are going to close the beat at the end of October. Um, so in theory, you have five very, very quiet months uh, on the river. Um, the beat that I'm on is Dryborough Lower, near St Boswells, near Melrose, in the Scottish borders. If you want to identify beats and get an insight to them throughout the whole of Scotland, go onto a website, which is Fishpal. That's F-I-S-H-P-A-L, all one word. Um, they're also a booking service. Um, I have a few slides to show you. Uh, they're not particularly uh, exciting, but it's better than looking at my face um, for the next 10 minutes. Um, just a few of the uh, topics that I'd uh, run through is the role of the ghillie, uh, training, the skill set, the salary, and a little summary uh, at the end. So the role of the ghillie, uh, you are there um, to manage the beat on behalf of the riparian owner. And I think what's key to remember here, as much as romantic, looking on a river, nice banks, looking at salmon leaping out of the water, it's a business for them. And at the end of the year, that business needs to come out in the black. Um, and that's primarily your responsibility to, to run that beat as a business for the riparian owner. 
Other duties, if you can still refer to them as duties um, with a military background, is um, fishing in accordance with the rules and regulations. Regulations are set down by, um, or sorry, the rules are set down by the Tweed Commission for us, but there's also statutory instruments set down in law by the Scottish Government. Um, other things include bank and river maintenance. This takes up a lot of Aguilar's time. River maintenance is uh, restricted due to the uh, implication, uh, the, the rules put on us by SEPA. Um, so that mainly uh, includes things like weed clearing, removing debris that's maybe floated down in a flood. Um, on our particular beat, while this slide maybe looks very pretty, we have a mile and a half of river, both banks. So you can see how much time that would take up. It's very pretty, but it takes a lot of time and effort to, uh, to keep it in that condition. Um, bank maintenance, yeah, mainly strimming, grass cutting, removing debris. The key role of your job though really is looking after the client that comes fishing and it's the client's needs. And if you remember, at the end of the day, it's the client that pays your wages. Um, on our particular beat, another, every beat varies depending on um, the quantity of fish caught there. Um, a day's fishing can cost everything from 40 pound in low season to 160 pound per person per day plus VAT in high season. And if somebody's paying 160 pound a day plus VAT, they expect a certain degree of uh, a certain level of service from their ghillie. Um, that service could include anything from advice on tackle on, arrive, on arrival, uh, how to set up a rod, what lines, what tips to set on, flies, but importantly, the river knowledge and the beat knowledge. If they've never been there before, they want you to identify the pools, where the lies are, and where's the best chance of them catching a fish. Um, in addition, you do the obligatory cups of teas and coffee at lunchtime on arrival. What you don't do is bookings. A booking system for this is done via fish pal, um, or in our case, we also use Savills, the land agent up in Inverness. Um, what's key for the ghillie here, there's a lot of work there, is to get an assistant, an under ghillie or a second boatman. Um, and for most people wanting to get into this line of work, it's via that second boatman or under gilly that gives you the in to get work on the river as a gilly and then progress up through um, to head gilly. Uh, training. A confession here, I never had any training before I became a gilly. So I did a quick bit of research on the uh, internet. And there's several means. However, we've seen Jenny Adamson um, from Lantra on. And if I had one recommendation, it would go to the Lantra course, look at their fisheries management course, call them up and talk to somebody. Having spoken to gillies above and below me on the river, um, there's none of them have been on an official training course. Everybody got into the line of business by turning up on a beat and getting a job as a second gilly, a part-time work. My only advice here is spend your resettlement money wisely, okay? Take advice. Courses that I would recommend, not directly fishing courses, are um, chainsaw courses. So when I was there with CS3031, I think it's now 2003 and 2004, brush cutting courses, um, strimmers and brush cutters, knapsack spraying course, first aid in the workplace, a bit of vermin control if you can do it, um, and a bit of boat work. The only way you'll get boat work training is to get onto a beat and talk nicely to the ghillie and they'll let you literally play in their boats. Um, a lot of people want to go into this line of work, think that it's essential they should be a fly casting instructor. Um, that is not essential. And in fact, a lot of fishermen can feel intimidated if they have a ghillie stood on their shoulder all day critiquing their casting. Um, if you do so, there's several uh, routes you can take. There's a social of advanced professional game angling instructors. Um, again, go on the internet, find one of these accredited um, associations and do a bit of it. But I wouldn't really uh, say it's essential. The essential qualities you need as a ghillie are how to tie a fly on so it doesn't come off when they hook a salmon, how to net a fish, how to do your fish recognition between a sea trout and a salmon, and whether your fish is fresh or if it's colored because it's been in the river system for some time. It's not a bad office, um, although it's a little bit small. Um, I just put skill set in because I, I thought I'd differentiate between skill set and training. Um, and because uh, 
I think we all have a skill set coming from the military that's pretty unique. Um, just a few key points I've put down here were reliability. Now, it so happens I got my lucky break to become a ghillie, ghillie via um, somebody being not very reliable. At the peak of the season, it's six days a week, irrespective of what the weather is like. Now, driver upper, which is a bit above me, employed a young civilian lad who uh, was happy to work six days a week as long as he could have Saturday and Sundays off. Um, so I couldn't quite work out how many days were in his week. So he didn't get past week two. Um, I stepped in at very short notice and turned out to be reliable. <clears throat> integrity. I always used to say integrity is non-negotiable in the military. Um, you do a deal with quite expensive equipment. And we do, who, do have some clients who like discretion. They don't want what's discussed on the river to go anywhere else other than the river. Um, in the military, again, we've all driven and we've got the ability to work alone or as part of that small team if we need to. However, <clears throat> excuse me, I think one of the key points is personality. We can all spin a good dip. Uh, we've all been involved in camp open days, ships open to visitors, uh, public relations roles with the public when we're in the military. People enjoy talking to you um, and they're interested in your history and your previous role in the military. Be proud of it and use it to your advantage. When you're fishing, <clears throat> you can spend a lot of time with the fishermen over two or three days, and it's your job to look after them. That will have benefits all round and get the return booking for next season. Um, <clears throat> just a note, in my case, I had very limited experience in actual salmon fishing. It was always too expensive for me when I was a young lad. However, I did have a lot of experience on fishing on some of the big locks in Scotland. Um, but I think once I got that in, where the other person was unreliable and didn't turn up, it was the ad calls of the, the cross-cut chainsaw, the streaming course, the knapsack uh, spraying course, along with the skill set that I've identified above that got me the job and allowed me to keep the job. Right, salary. Um, none of us want to work for free. I can only say when it comes to salary, this is it in accordance with Willie Rutledge. If you agree or disagree, it's entirely up to you. Whenever I was looking for work, I always said, um, my pension is mine. Um, and I'd earned it or you've earned it. So don't use it in your negotiations. Don't go in there saying, right, the average ghillie gets paid 20 grand a year. So to get the job, I'll say, I've got my pension. So I'll undercut him and I'll work for 15 grand. Your skills, your time and your effort has a value. Okay. So you need to be looking for a salary that matches that value. Um, in general, on the river, there's two types of employment. There's the employee, um, where you work for directly for the state, or you can be um, self-employed. The employee is normally the head ghillie. So the benefits of being the head ghillie would normally come with a tied house or a tied cottage. So therefore, you're not paying any rent, you're not paying your council tax, you don't even pay for your electric. So that's um, a big part of your monthly outgoings in normal life. Uh, you would normally get a vehicle and the fuel that goes with it. You'd be on the pension and you'll get a small salary. Salaries vary considerably between the states. I haven't asked one or two gillies um, next to me, somewhere between 20 to 25,000. Now, when you're <clears throat> on that salary, that does tie you to the estate and uh, can be other estate duties. So if there's no fishing on, for example, the beat below me, the fisherman then goes and works on the state grass or the state gardens. Um, and he ends up with the standard almost 30 days holiday in a year, which is including these bank holidays. There are a lot of estates are steering away from um, employing a full-time ghillie. And in the case, unless thing changes, things change next Thursday when I meet the estate again, um, by employing myself, the state can make up to a 50% saving um, rather than employing a full-time ghillie. So I like myself, I'm a self-employed, basically a contract ghillie. So I invoice the estate for every day that I work. Now it does have some benefits. Um, the things that I can offset against my tax are the mileage, a lot of my equipment, so my waders, boots, uh, waterproofs, um, flies, cartridges for vermin control, and quite a lot of my clothing. Um, <clears throat> when I was doing my resettlement, 
I went to a briefing. Uh, it was only an hour and a half, I think. And it was by two gentlemen from the HMRC. It was probably one of the best briefings that I went to during the whole of my resettlement phase. So if you see that coming up at one of the resettlement centers, go and see them. Get away from the stigma that the, the tax man is a, the dreaded man that's just trying to take your money from you. It was a, one of the best briefings that I've been to. Another top tip um, being self-employed would probably get an accountant. It sounds grand. I think my accountant costs me something like £138 a year. It's offsetable against my tax. And they come up with the best tips for money saving that you can get. Really good uh, value for money. So if you get a job as a contract gilly, you have to work out your daily rate of pay. Uh, no use going in there asking for uh, footballers' wages because it's going to be driven by the local economy. So say, for example, I was to work for £100 a day. Currently on the river, um, this year has been a little bit different because of COVID. I would work about 190 days a year. Now, traditionally, fishermen have um, been very good with gratuities. Fishermen, like shooters, do tip uh, considerably well. And as a head ghillie or a ghillie, you would expect to make probably about £5,000 a year in gratuities. Now, obviously, that, along with your salary, is taxable. Um, so simple maths, uh, put together my daily rate of pay and tips, I'll be working for £25,000 a year for about 190 days work a year. Now, it's only then that I then include my pension because that's what I've earned previously from my time in the military. And it's up to you to work out that life balance, your quality of life, um, and are you willing to work for that salary? The only thing to note as a contract gilly is if there's a day when there's no bookings, you don't go in, you don't get any pay. It's quite simple. Um, as a summary, um, it's a complete contrast uh, from the military and everybody that comes fishing asks how I've made that transition. All I can ever say, quite easily. It's a great surrounding. It is a contrast, but with a little bit of training and using the skill sets that you've already got, um, it's not difficult to make that transition. Into the ghillie world, world, you do need that little bit of fishing background. You cannot go into it with no fishing background at all. The difficult bit, is getting that in. How do you get into the uh, into the beat, in to talk to the gillies? All I can say is go to the fishing beats, check them out on fish pal where they are close to you, talk to the gillies, talk to the factor, the under factor, the estate manager. Everyone that I have spoken to uh, got in via one of the above, going and talking to the gillies. Um, aim for that part-time job to begin with. It's a great job. You don't even have to do any annual reports on your troops and there's limited IT, which is always good for me. You get to meet interesting people. And remember, these people come to fish because they want to have an enjoyable day out. So it's a, it's a, mutual, uh, a mutual agreement on the river um, to enjoy yourself. Um, it's a fantastic office, even in, uh, in the rain with an easterly wind. And uh, it's not obligatory to have a black Labrador. Um, now a little pitch, um, if I may, for myself. Anybody that's interested in become, getting into this um, environment, please uh, contact Fiona and get my details. I'm based at Lower Dryborough in St. Boswell's in the Scottish Borders. Might not be local for a lot of years, but that's where I am. Um, get the details from Fiona. I had a particularly traumatic year this year because I didn't have an assistant and I'm desperate for one for next year. So that's probably the biggest in that you'll get is somebody asking you to come and uh, work for them. So. I'm desperate for somebody next year. Um, if there's any questions, uh, please fire them across at the discussion uh, stage. But that's it from me, Fiona. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Willie. And I've uh, stopped you screen sharing to save you the, the pain of working out how to do it. So uh, I've taken your slides down for you. Um, that was absolutely fantastic. And if I just underline um, the point you made about how people have got in there, not through having a raft of qualifications, though that's definitely added to the value of you as an individual, but through experience. And that's a theme that's come up in previous Insight Days, where people have said, actually, as soon as they stopped focusing on courses and qualifications, but started going and getting real experience, not only did the network grow and the opportunities come up, but actually they grew in confidence because they found out that they could actually do the job and they started to understand how to make a, a living out of it. 
so um, thank you very much um, for emphasising um, that. And there's a lot of other fantastic points um, that come, have come out of that, um, which for time we haven't got to, the opportunity to explore any more. Um, but I will um, put your um, details there and um, and perhaps we'll talk a bit later about uh, just putting a small uh, a small note elsewhere and see if we can't find you your second boatman, um, yeah. assuming that uh, you'll be doing a lot more fishing um, next season than you've been able to this year. Yeah. Thanks ever so much, Willie. That's fantastic. Okay, no, thank you very much. So let's uh, move from um, fishing um, back onto the land um, and to the world of uh, dairy farming. Uh, Becca Brown um, has been farming um, for just over uh, two months. And at the start of this year, um, she was uh, still serving on a warship um, and wistfully wondering whether there was any prospect of doing something with cattle at some stage in the future. For me, um, it's a personal point of uh, satisfaction that Rural Link was able to help her secure her current role. But what we'll do now is, uh, is by way of an interview, is get her story of how she went from warship to dairy farmer in a few short weeks. So, um, Becca, are you uh, you're hiding somewhere in there? If you put your uh, yeah, I'm here. video on, video there on. you are. Oh, you're not in. You're not in amongst the the, the dairy itself that you threatened to be in. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I broke out. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so um, well, thanks very much um, for coming along. Um, and only a few short weeks since the role, so really at the uh, at the other end of the experience um, thing. Um, so uh, I think what we said we'd start with, if if you could explain where you are and about the farm and tell us a bit about what you do to get people in the a feel for, for who you are? Uh, well, I, um, I'm the general manager um, of Dairy Farm, um, which is a dairy farm up in Port William, um, which is in Dumfries and Galloway, right, right on the coast. And um, so I've got a great view of the sea every day, so I don't get to miss that. Um, and what they do here is a, they're a spring block carving unit. Uh, they've got a thousand dairy cows um, with 800 um, cows, which will be following on um, in the next couple of years. Um, at the moment, we're in the drying off season. So we're um, starting to um, dry the cows off, ready for a rest before they start calving in February. Um, and then we go through calving until um, approximately the end of March, um, and then on to breeding again um, at the end of that, uh, starting in May round to about July, um, and then into what I'm assured is the quiet time, um, because at the moment, um, the, there seems to be no time in the day to, to get anything else done. Um, but it's, uh, it's pretty good up here. Um, it's a thousand um, acre farm. And um, so it's, it's a lot to get your head around. Um, and there's a lot going on um, outside of the cows. Um, lots of organization um, required to make sure the water and the electric fencing is kept up to date and that maintenance schedules are, are adhered to. Um, and um, the big thing of people management. There's only a small team here of about 10 people. So it's it's more trying to um, do do everything with with few people, which I'm sure lots of um, military people will understand. Um, lean manning, um, and trying to get all the jobs done with with very little resource. <laughs> Sounds very very familiar, <laughs> but of course that's all about to change because the armed forces is about to have a huge uh, cash injection, so we're told. Oh, yeah. um, and but Rupert's reassured us that's going to happen with the Scottish farming economy as well. So uh, we're all going to be rich. Um, Flippancy aside, so casting your mind uh, back to the start of the year, um, what steps have you taken to move towards resettlement? Let's put it that way. Um, so just over a year ago, um, I did the high ground course with um, Anna Baker Creswell, which um, was brilliant in terms of giving me um, a, a good overview of all of the rural sector um, and going through um, everything from being a ranger to, um, to working on a dairy farm uh, to small holding, to working outside on a golf course and doing green keeping. Um, and from that, I, I knew that I wanted to work with cows. Um, basically, um, I spent every morning that I was on that course um, milking the cows at the local college that we, we did the course on. Um, but from there, um, I went back to sea. I, I was on a fishery protection boat, so doing four weeks on, two weeks off. Um, and then initially found it quite difficult to get into the swing of networking um, and trying to follow up on, on a career in agriculture. Um, so in January, I'd, I'd basically um, given up on 
getting into agriculture at all and decided that operations management would be the way to go. Um, I was looking at Amazon um, as the, the easy route in from the military and particularly when COVID hit, um, it was a secure job to move into um, while still getting out of the Navy um, as, as I planned. Um, and it wasn't until May when I, um, I did exactly this, an insight day um, with Fiona. Um, and it really re-sparked my interest in, in getting back into agriculture and, and made me realise that actually that, that is definitely what I wanted to do. And I didn't want to work in a warehouse. I didn't want to be inside all day. Um, I wanted to be outside and, and stick to my dream of working with cows, um, which is what I told everyone when, when they asked what I was going to do when I left the Navy. Um, I then started following a bit more of a route of maybe going back to university um, and doing a diploma in agriculture. Um, but again, following on from the inside day, it, um, and, and it's less advertised um, in, on things like LinkedIn, um, but there, there are people out there who are looking for, um, for veterans and looking for ex-military people. Um, and Fiona is brilliant at bringing all of them together. Um, and, and it started to open up a network for me. Um, I'd left the ship by that point, so I had a lot more time to follow up on, on all the contacts. Um, and I started following up and I applied to a couple of jobs um, through a, one of the recruitment consultants who um, Fiona knows. And, um, and although unsuccessful, um, I, it, it pushed me to, to focus on that route again. Um, and then it was purely by luck that um, Fiona got a call from a, an HR lady in Scotland um, who knew of a farmer who was looking for someone with management skills um, because he had he got lots of people with farming experience, but hadn't got um, anyone who had got management um, experience. And he was he was ideally looking for the full package, um, but um, it was was talked around into the idea that maybe he could teach the farming experience, um, and um, but the management um, would would help me along. Uh, so I came up uh, for a week's trial in August, um, and it was at no cost to the farmer at all. Um, so Rory was um, really kind in, in giving me his time for the full week. And, um, and now that I'm here, I realize how much um, he doesn't have that time um, really to dedicate, but he, he really took time out of him, his day to take me around and show me the farm um, and see what we could do. Um, and I claimed all the accommodation back um, and all of the travel um, back through the Navy and through resettlement um, and used it as resettlement time. Um, and then at the end of that, I, I got offered the job here. And it was purely through, um, through hard work, uh, showing that the military skills that we all get through basic training, um, whether you're an officer, whether you're um, a junior eight or um, the various army and RAF equivalents, um, we all have the same level of, of work ethic. Um, we can all do the attention to detail. We can all work long hours um, and, and really push yourself through what you might think is quite difficult um, like at difficult times. And you've got a lot to do and not much time to do it in. And you can push through that and you can still be enthusiastic and still be cheerful um, and keep a, keep a good face on it. Um, and I think it's that with the reliability um, and enthusiasm being a, a, a key one um, that sort of swung it for me after my week's trial. Um, and made Rory think that maybe it's worth giving it a go. So here I am now. So, um, so just to, to just dwell on that just slightly. So you you went and did that work attachment, as we know. But what did you do to prepare for that to make sure that you did give the the best possible impression? And conversely, you know, not being so sure that you would necessarily get a job out of it. But how did you make sure that you would get the the best learning experience out of it? if that's all it, it became? Um, so I did a lot of research into the farm and I, um, I'm quite lucky that Rory's got quite a profile on um, social media. Um, so I could learn quite a lot from, from doing research about the farm itself. Um, and then I sort of requested a lot about what their farming practices were and what they focused on and what kind of herd he had um, and what kind of carving route. And then I did a massive amount of reading basically um, and read up on absolutely everything I could to do with spring block carving. Um, he runs a New Zealand dairy system here. So um, I went onto the Dairy New Zealand website, which um, is, if anyone wants to know about dairy farming, it's the sort of font of all knowledge um, in the world of dairy farming. So 
I spent a lot of time looking at that and um, looking at how rotary parlors work. So he's got two rotary parlors here. Um, and combined with that, and then when I got here, I realized that the people-based skills and um, the systems knowledge you get, although I was a warfare officer and um, we all have to learn uh, the engine systems on a ship. Um, so I used that knowledge um, to apply to, parlor, to the two parlors. Um, and I think that, that kind of impressed um, from a perspective of um, he had not seen that level of systems knowledge in, in a new person. Um, bringing in the people management side um, and talking to him about his staff and any staffing issues that he had, which um, were all very relatable to, to what I'd seen in the, na in the Navy, um, with the exception of drug use. Now, that was a new one for me. Um, but, um, but all of that, it has a massive overlap between farming and the military. Um, and the community in farming is really similar to, to what you find in the military. It's, it's very much a way of life. Um, particularly where I am, it's, it's very remote here. And the, the core um, employment in the area is farming. Um, vastly, it's dairy farming up here, but um, can be sheep or cattle. Um, and the community feel of that is, is very similar to when you live on, on a base or something like that. Um, so it, it sort of at times feels a bit like home from home. Um, they, they don't know a lot about the military, but I seem to have fitted in pretty well with the with the same um, mentality and the same ethos that that they have in agriculture. So, uh, so as you uh, as you look back, what's your top tip for for service leakers like you who don't have very much experience, but they have got that certainty that that you came across um, that they know what they want to do, but they haven't got the experience. What's your what's your advice for people following a similar route? I'd say persevere, um, believe in yourself. There's always um, a route in, um, although it might not seem obvious um, at the time. Um, narrow your section down because agriculture is a huge, huge industry, which I, don't, I didn't appreciate until I started researching it more. If you want a job that's an indoor job, but in the agricultural industry, there, there are huge amounts of those. If you want to work with tractors, if you want to work with animals, um, there's there's so many different routes um, that you can go into in, in agriculture that you really have to I think focus your your search um, and and then do the research into that prove that you are keen and enthusiastic to do it and then much like Willie said approach farmers approach people when I was um, still down in Portsmouth I went to a couple of dairy farms locally um, I just approached them to see if I could go and get some experience with them before I came up um, to Scotland, just so I had a, a basic idea of, of dairy farming, having never been on a dairy farm before in my life. Um, so it, it just um, it, it gives you that, that knowledge, which, although they don't expect it, when you do um, have an understanding of it, it, it makes them realise that you are keen, you are willing to, to put your all into it. Um, and then I think the, the biggest thing is when you get here is, is not being afraid to do anything. Um, the other day I had my hand down a drain, which was about a foot deep in cow shit. And then um, the next day I'm in the office doing staff rotors. So it's, um, it's about getting involved and being willing to do all of the different jobs, whether it's um, the lowest level job up to the highest level job. Sounds like very similar values to, uh, <laughs> to walking around and inspecting bits and pieces of a of a ship um that's a really fascinating um insight into um a fantastic um journey thank you um very much we've got to we've got to press on but um i hope you've got time to hang around um for a few moments um to see if any questions um do pop up um it's, it's brilliant and it's so good to see you in your uh, in your cottage there or whatever it is <laughs> um wearing your <laughs> slightly tired looking farming clothes and, uh, <laughs> and beaming um from, uh, yeah. from your new job all, all my uniform that i still wear absolutely <laughs> it's another uniform isn't it <laughs> yes. um, brilliant thanks becca thanks very much run away um rupert you were so good earlier we've asked you back that's uh, thank you as i mentioned before rupert farms um running a herd of red deer um and also um a herd of cattle gled park um, does look like a, another beautiful place to live and work and uh, one day I do hope to pop in for the uh, the often proposed cup of tea um, 
Rupert, how on earth did you manage to establish a brand new farm and build up the successful business you now have? Well, I'm, uh, I've got to say, I'm, I'm feeling sort of re-inspired having followed Becca, which I had no idea. I know Rory very well. Anyone who's serious about farming in Southwest Scotland uh, will, will know him. And I don't know what her geography is like, but uh, the Borg Peninsula looks across to the Wigtonshire Peninsula and she's the other side of other side of that. So in relative Scotland terms, she's a spit away. Uh, and I have to say, I really enjoyed uh, Willie's piece as well. So uh, thanks for the opportunity. Can you can you see my screen share? I've put screen share, but I'm... Not yet, no. There Here we it go. Comes. That's it. Okay, so slight, slightly different, but then uh, I'm happy to be slightly different, he said. Uh, and I suppose, you know, I have to say this to start with, and maybe that says something about me, uh, not being a caricature. Uh, when you're christened Rupert, the only one in my family, much to my own disgust, uh, I suppose there don't seem to be many options open to you apart from being an army officer. <laughs> but strangely, I did actually uh, go to eight schools because uh, I come from a very military family, didn't take any of it too seriously and found myself joining the green jackets as a rifleman back in March 1988 where again because of the way I speak and because I was called Rupert I suppose I ought to get on and get commissioned I've already said that uh soldiering was my first love and I think what it taught me when I looked at that 24 years is what I said already in my opening piece the only limitation in most people's lives is themselves, their view of themselves and the rest of it. Uh, my great grandfather farmed not far from where Becker is, had a, had a holding uh, and was a grain merchant out of Garleston in Wigtonshire. And I spent a lot of time in Northern Ireland, certainly in the first 12 years of my career and used to come just across to see relatives up and down the west coast of Scotland. I would constantly be shown, because it's not too far from the ferry, uh, you know, where my great grandfather used to farm and, and be told all these wonderful stories about things. But it did seem an impossible dream. Uh, my mother was widowed quite early. Uh, she's still about, bless her. So, uh, you know, it's my business. I want to lay this out right at the beginning. It's got nothing to do with inheritance. Uh, I had a couple of lucky breaks, but they're to do with consistency in terms of my own ambition. I bought a uh, one bedroom flat in Southwest London when nobody wanted them. And I bought a 1970s Aston Martin when nobody wanted them. A long story short, uh, I was in a position, because again, my priorities changed from when I was a 20 something to when I was a 40 something. Turned them into a small farm in southwest Scotland, back more or less within spit of, of where my father's family are from. And why did I do all of that? Why didn't I take that well-trodden path uh, into better paid employment, uh, money for old rope appointments in financial services, like a, a few of my buddies, or the dreaded security work, or in a rural context, you know, Savills or the equivalent. Well, it's that realization that I enjoy above all being my own boss. And the reality is for all our service people, we've, we've been in charge at various stages, but we've never truly uh, been the boss. And for me, I felt I had to go for it and I had to really uh, go for it with a small farm. My fallback plan was that if I turned out to be a terrible farmer, I would, in the words of my brother and sister, uh, go and get a proper job and of course being in southwest Scotland it's not too far from uh, the train at Carlisle to do that but the truth is that farming is a wonderful lifestyle I mean uniquely so and that's really been enforced for me during uh, this whole Covid thing uh, time time with my family space independence the fact that I'm producing something of real value food uh, all of all of uh, 2020 in particular has reinforced that uh, this was the right decision. And I think the other thing is, you know, what, what drives me is uh, I've always read sort of 
widely. And I remember reading a book years and years ago uh, when I read nothing but military biographies about a German Fallschirmjäger who'd been sort of captured prisoner of war in uh, Cornwall and uh, fell in love with a local Cornish girl, didn't go back to Germany. And uh, he bought one acre of land that no one else wanted. And everyone thought he, he was, uh, you know, daft. What did he know? Uh, and he started growing sort of cut flowers, daffodils on it. He's long since dead, but the family now, I think are the largest flower producers in the south, southwest of England. And there were a number of little bits and pieces in that book that just gave me this idea uh, that it can be done. And I'm someone who's determined to succeed. So what I'm saying now is slightly different in that it's very much about how you're going to make it work if you want to really do it on your own. So you get your plot of land. It doesn't matter if it's a, and, and look into it. Western Scotland, a lot of the islands. Uh, I used to have a cousin that taught uh, up in Shetland. People are desperate for working age people to come and settle. There are crofting opportunities, there are share farming opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. But if you can get your hands on something uh, before you choose your enterprise, it's a better way to look at what you've ended up with and what that will support. Don't fall into the trap of deciding you want to produce organic carrots and you end up you know, too far from anywhere you can sell them uh, no one supports the machinery equipment nearby etc and you've got the wrong kind of soil i'm sure jonathan would comment on that so understand what you've en ended up with where you are what's realistic understand yourself there's no point in planning out the next stage of your life and here's the reality i've just turned 50 you know there's no point in lining up work you're not going to want to do in the second half of your life so understand yourself. What are the things that you enjoy doing? How much do you want to be outside? Do you want that mixed portfolio of, yeah, a bit of time outside, but perhaps the odd sort of camaraderie of sort of union work or, or something else off farm? Read widely. OK, so I've given you the one example of, of the flower business, but, I, you know, determined to, to read widely. And watch reality TV. Now you're expecting me to say something about how that's useful for farming. It is. Two programs have been hugely instructional in how I operate. Gas Monkey Garage, the first couple of series, when he was still heading in a particular direction. That's a reality program about flipping cars. And Gold Rush, and particularly uh, the Beats family, who seem to make millions every year with a lot of equipment from the 1970s. Now, I won't go into a lot of detail, but I'll return to some of those themes. Understand what best practice is. Everyone's looking at you all the time, a bit like when you're in the military. You're assessed immediately on what your webbing looks like, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, if you're going to get into agriculture, if you're going to be part of that pyramid supporting that ambitious target of 30 billion pounds worth of, of food and drink, think about what consumers want. Start building your story. I started with those blocks. And the truth is, it is cheaper to have your animals outside all year long, which is what I do. It is cheaper not to lay lots of concrete and build sheds for them. It is cheaper to let them uh, manure where they are on the hill and not to buy a muck spreader, et cetera, et cetera. But more importantly, the person that you want to buy, in my case, meat, wants to think of animals on the hill in Scotland living as natural a life as possible. And if you don't consider your customer, whatever stage they're at from the beginning, you will be less successful and you won't be able to get a premium for what you do. But there's a big hurdle to that. Uh, the biggest one being borrowing money for an activity that you don't have a track record in. So very frustratingly, I, 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 I'd been with a well-known poorly run bank now owned by the government for my whole military career. And I went to them and said, right, this is great. you know." I've retired, I'm going to do this, et cetera, et cetera. You know, please lend me some money. Uh, 
you can't get past the computer and, and these days they're not sort of responsive at, at, at that level. So again, think about net worth, what was important to you. I gave the example of the car. Uh, exciting cars are a, a, a thing of your 20s. All of those things went in order to build the business. And I was very pleased to buy a brand new Isuzu pickup uh, for less than the price in 2013 that a 15 year old Land Rover would have been. So, you know, it is about targeting what you're doing. It is about committing to the business. Be as flexible as possible. Don't start your business with a whole, of red, a whole load of red lines or things you won't do. Let it evolve. See what people are coming to you for. See what people will pay for. And recognize that that primary requirement is for you to make money. I'm a family man. It's very important to me that at the end of this journey, my wife and children still have a relationship with me and they've enjoyed the journey as well. So don't turn down unexpected opportunities when they come up. Uh, take the off farm work. I now have a sort of blended portfolio. It, uh, it allows, uh, you know, for aspects of a social life, for example, the NFU has been fantastic with its Big get together specifically when I was first farming 2013, 2014, you know, for Nicole and I to go up St. Andrews, take part in that network, get to know sort of other people, but in a good social setting, people who are committed to the same line of work. Uh, I think this has been touched on earlier. It was very good to hear Willie, you know, obviously thought about, you know, his pension, that position, etc., uh, the importance of a good accountant. You will want to borrow money in a business. You'll need to borrow money to make progress. So don't do a load of, oh, well, I'll do it for cash. And then, you know, it's not in the books anywhere. Have, have the evidence, build up the evidence that actually you are selling money. Uh, sorry, you are selling items. Money is coming in, et cetera, et cetera. And in relation to that, build a team of professional supporters that want you to succeed. I have cut away since I've been farming. My bank my lawyer <laughs> and i've selected a, a a new accountant specifically for this job you don't want professional relationships with people that don't care if you you sink or swim and the final one there have a mentor and i won't go into that we talked about it earlier have have a mentor that you know is really going to help you in your direction of travel so a quick bit of context I've got a small farm in modern standards. It's just over a hundred acres. People will tell you that's not big enough uh, to make money from, but I also have, because of my native cattle choice, a conservation grazing agreement with the National Trust for Scotland. And I have neighbors of a certain age, the grasslets are often coming up. So those, those variables are all there. In a Scottish context, my land is less favored area, severely disadvantaged, scrubland and wet areas, a natural place uh, to raise deer there for. I, I'm doing what the land suits, not trying to do something else. And I'm flexible. The photograph there is cutting blackthorn, uh, which I sold to uh, Peacock Salt to set up blackthorn salt. It's a premium craft salt product being produced out of air now. You can look it up on the internet. I mean, that's an unexpected opportunity, but it's an opportunity that came my way because keep my ear to the ground, I networked. And when I heard someone was looking, I was prepared to put welding gloves on, get through a couple of pairs, get out there with a pair of secateurs and cut one meter lengths of blackthorn. Something previously seen, and most serious farmers would tell you it's just a hazard unless you want to keep animals away from somewhere. I'm also selling firewood, countryside's full of people who put a log burner in. Don't burn your uh, fallen trees in big stoops. Don't let your fallen trees rot into the ground. Have the discipline to log them up, put them in the barn, dry them off, sell them to someone, 70 pounds a tote there. Scotland's full of stones. Believe it or not, there are always people wanting to buy stones. Be the person that's got them in a heap and is prepared to sell them. When, you know, when someone moves into the village and buys a new stone and they want to, uh, buys a new house, wants to repair the old stone wall, et cetera, you can be the person that supplies it. And honey, which is one of the things I'm doing cooperatively. The speed at which opportunities have come just because I committed. Uh, I wanted to be professional. I didn't uh, have any 
you know, agricultural CV and the rest of it. I had done my deer stalking certificates while I'd been uh, serving and I did my deer managers qualification actually as part of my resettlement because I thought, you know, Scotland's full of deer, bound to be handy. And then really it all came together. I thought, why don't I manage deer on my own property? The most difficult part of the farm I set up. I decided professionals are assured. We're used to assurance in the military. Got myself assured. And then the people that did it said, wow, you're the first, <laughs> you're the first person who's become assured in the whole of the UK. We got some press coverage from that. As a result, one thing led to another. Uh, 2017, I got taken on by Akura, now part of Lloyd's Register, to assess other deer enterprises around Scotland producing Scottish quality wild venison. It gets me off farm. Uh, the, obviously, it's an expense regime, but I get paid a set amount for every other business that I inspect. So some business planning tips. The only business training I had uh, in that 24 years was uh, going to a course run at RAF Northolt called Running Your Own Business, laid on by the RAF as, as, as part of the resettlement. Uh, I hadn't seen it anywhere else. It wasn't part of the CTP, but because uh, my second to last boss had been in the RAF. He, I told him I was planning on leaving. He told me, oh, have you, have you gone and done this course? And again, very useful in terms of telling me things like the importance of being VAT registered. A lot of people will say, oh, but I'm not gonna make 85,000 pounds you know, a year to start off with, so I don't need to be VAT registered. Well, if you're VAT registered, you get 20% back. 100% of your spend on work-related stuff. You'd be mad not to do it. 20% 20 20 back on all your farm inputs is significant because have no doubt everyone in agriculture is VAT registered. Get that structure right. Limit your machinery. I have one 30-year-old tractor. I just sold a 40-year-old crawler for slightly more than I got it from. Do your maths have a margin and stick to it. Know what it costs you to produce whatever it is. Know when something is, uh, you know, a good, a good return on it. The Blackthorn cost me nothing. Thought about my labor. I came up with a figure. No one haggled. I got paid it. A fantastic opportunity. Uh, and cooperate. We are doing a number of cooperations. If you look at our farm website, we cooperate now with the local cookery school. That's brought extra customers to me for direct carcass sales. Uh, and, and it's giving hand on fist sort of opportunities for us as a host location, a uh, little bit of agritourism. Keep looking ahead and remember everything is for sale. Uh, the future, professional development. It's great to have Lantron today. You know, I've got so much from being in the NFU. Industry bodies lay on free training. It's amazing what's been there. Look for like-minded businesses. The guy who runs the cookery school in Kakubri, him and I, we get on. We've created opportunities together. Two of us thinking about how we're going to develop something is better than me on my own. Work out who you want your customers to be. I've worked out on a smaller scale. I need to be producing a premium product. Frankly, everyone needs to be producing a premium product. They're always easier to shift when it comes to food, as long as it hasn't cost you a fortune to get there. Find out who your customer is going to be, work with them, understanding all those margin and other things. And the final point is, this is a general thing, engaging with the community. In my army career, I had all those kind of, well, you know, are you in my gang? Are you, you know, are you not? We move around, we, we, we start relationships quickly, we move on, et cetera, et cetera. You are going to plot up, especially if you buy a bit of land in that community for a very long time, potentially for the rest of your life. Invest in that relationship. Uh, make it part of the business in terms of doing open days when it's available, offering things perhaps to uh, local groups or activities you like, but tie it in as part of the business. So I turn down the opportunity to be local SAFA chairman. 
there's no it, it doesn't tie in with my life you know that might be for some time in the future when my son's taken over if he decides to take over the farm but being regional chair for nfu scotland tied in do you see what i mean so do things that mesh naturally uh, together and my final thought know what success looks like for you I am not someone that gets excited about machinery. So I don't have on my, you know, Euro millions sort of bucket list, actually that kind of, you know, Fent tractor, Bluetooth enabled, et cetera, et cetera. I'm quite happy with my uh, all secondhand, all the older equipment. What is a thrill for me is that my family have seen in this short period that we've been farming, We've got all new windows and doors in the farmhouse. <laughs> that is success. That's success for us. I fix the roof on every on on every building. You know, have have goals in life uh, and make them achievable for yourself. But understand what they are and have a direction of travel. Final thought reinforces what I said uh, at the beginning. I had no idea uh, starting this back in uh, October 2012 when I left Colchester, that the speed of opportunity, uh, the speed of change, the things that would come our way would be, would be like this. So it really, it makes me very buoyant, very positive and very happy uh, to be an enthusiastic sort of uh, mentor and encourager of any of those that want to make a journey. Everyone's in a different place. Everyone will be in a different place financially, but don't forget what I said right at the beginning. You know, there are all sorts of islands, crofts, communities in Scotland crying out for working age people. And they are keen if you will commit to help you on that journey. Even if you decide like me to carve out your own little bit and go for it. So good luck everyone. Rupert, that's fantastic. Um, thank you very much. Um, and if you could stop sharing your screen, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Um, they, so just to, to underline, um, a lot of the lessons that are um, rammed um, at people in uh, career transition partnership and workshops is that if you want to go down an entrepreneurial line and set yourself on your own, the first thing you need to do is write your business plan. Well, there's a balance to be struck, I think, um, Rupert's just illustrated. Of course, you need to know what success looks like in the short term. You need to know where your financial um, red lines are. Um, but you need to be flexible and adaptable and willing to learn so that you're in a position to take up opportunities um, when they come. So writing and following a rigid business plan um, doesn't necessarily make sense when you don't really know all the ins and outs of the sector and you know you're going to learn and develop. But having goals and having um, what in other aspects of our military life we might call measure of effectiveness in place, just so you can look in the rear view mirror or take stock, whether it's annually or, or however you decide, just to know where you are. And that applies whether you're going all in with serious capital investment, as Rupert has, or whether you're doing something on a smaller scale and um, with a portfolio of interests, as we've um, discussed earlier. Um, so um, we uh, we are running um, slightly behind, but uh, um, I think um, it's only fair before we move on to give everyone uh, the opportunity to stretch their legs. Um, so um, if I can thank um, all the speakers there, um, Willie, um, massive tour de force, um, Becca, totally inspiring, um, and Rupert, um, congratulations on, on what you've achieved in eight years. Um, I think, I hope um, everyone who's uh, heard three have realized that um it is possible to follow your passion and to uh, and to make a success just like everything else in life and in military life you've got to have um a plan and then you've got to have the courage of your convictions and then you know you know what people are friendly and they'll help you and advise you so let's uh, take a break um and we'll come back um, to uh, to move into the food production sector. Let's just give everyone a chance and we'll come back at 14.30, five minutes after the advertised time. Thanks very much.
and then I'll just take it as Hello, welcome to the couple of people who've just joined. So we've just got a, we're just five minutes behind. So we're just having a break before we start on the next uh, session. But you're very welcome. Thanks. That's that's me, Patrick here. Oh, hello, Patrick. Welcome along. <laughs> Thanks. Great. How's it, Thank going? How's it going? Yeah, seems to be seems to be going well. Good. Um, lots of. Uh, Good pithy uh, advice and information, which is uh, what we want. It's fantastic. Oh, excellent. Good. You've uh, worked See, out uh, how to use the technology at your end, have you? Um, not really. See, see, um, when I want to put some slides up, yeah, I've, I've got the slides open on my computer, so. If I just go to the green button at the bottom, share screen. Yeah, just try that now. It won't let you do it, but it'll give you an error message. If it gives you that error message, I know you're doing the right thing. Yeah. So just try it now. You cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. Yeah, that's just because I'm screen sharing. But what will happen when I stop with this screen share yeah. is that then the presentation you've got open yeah. will then be available for you. You double click that and that'll be you screen sharing. Simple as that. Okay. Okay, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, everyone else has no we, pressure, but everyone else has managed so far today. Yeah, no, I mean, we, we, we do use Zoom um, a fair bit, but I've never been in the position that I've needed to share screens. So, mm. um, well, so. we're all learning new skills this year, so exactly. that's your opportunity. Exactly, that's what I'm thinking too. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. Good. Well, you're very welcome. And um, and there's a couple of other people who've just joined, so you are also very welcome. Um. Okay, so uh, welcome, uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, we'll start to uh, to get going again. Um, just uh, to uh, to say, um, you're very welcome to tweet, like, share, invite others. Um, anything you want to do to publicise this. Um, just during the last session, just for the awareness of uh, speakers, we've now got. Um, a researcher on the call who's um, potentially um, uh, pitching a, a, a program to Channel Five, and she's here to find out about the uh, the resettlement um, experience. So um, just be uh, just be aware of that. Shouldn't change anything you say, but it's only fair to mention it. Um, and uh, and obviously we've still got a lot of uh, service leavers as well as uh, the team who are uh, presenting. Um, so there you go, Amber um, isn't shy, um, she's mentioned in the chat, hi that's me, um, hello Amber, I'm glad you could join us. Um, Jonathan's put his uh, contact details um, in the chat, he's about to, to talk, and so we'll move on now um, to the session on food production. Um, Jonathan, feel free to, uh, to uncloak yourself, oh there we go, you All have, done. sorry, there you are. Um, and I will do the same. There we go. Sorry. Here we go. Sorry. Um, so uh, Jonathan Holmes is a recognised expert in uh, sward management for Red Deer. He also lectures in agronomy and runs his own business, Laudington Park Agronomy. Many moons ago, he was a young sapper junior NCO. It's been quite a journey, he tells me. So Jonathan, I'm intrigued to hear about it. How did you find this career? What is it that you do and what are your reflections on the journey? Right, thanks Fiona and thanks everybody else. It's uh, great to be in such exalted and informed company. What I want to talk about is, uh, I just want to give a few examples of 
things where the transferable skills come into being on a huge level within agriculture. And then to talk a little bit about my history and evolution, talk about what agronomy is, what I do and how I do it, how to become an agronomist. So the few examples I wanted to say is that uh, I'm self-employed now and I'll explain how I got to here. I've been for about sort of 25 odd years, partly because I'm still a shockingly bad civilian. I probably always will be and it just gets worse the older and grumpier I get. But it, just to give you an example, there's a couple of contractors that work in conjunction with me. Um, and with a lot of the work that I do, I, I do a lot of soil science. I work with sword management for horses, deer, cattle or sheep. So sword is effectively upper layers of soil and grass and that interaction. It's wonderfully complex, keeps me going for hours. Uh, Any time I want to bore anyone to death, I could talk to you about it for at least three hours without any slides. But the, the point is, that's my skill. So once I've investigated an environment, find out what needs doing, I can't do the up and down and round and round and the remedial action that may be required. So certainly in my part of the world, which even though I work all over the UK, is predominantly Yorkshire and Lincolnshire, I've got two sets of contractors that I just love working with. And the reason I love working with them is the one in Lincolnshire, I only found out a year ago, he was a, an ex-royal as well, as in commando. And the contractor that I work with predominantly in the sort of Yorkshire region, uh, he got to the last week of Sandhurst, he played rugby for Sandhurst, smashed his thigh up in four places, and that was the end of his career. But the point is, is that philosophy that transfers so well and so easily. And I love any environment that I work with. That's why for my sins, I enjoy working with Rupert because it's that easy mentality of give me a reason for doing something and yep, that's what we're gonna do. The contractor that I work with in Yorkshire, um, he's largely quad bike based. He works extremely hard, ridiculously long hours because the thing is within agriculture, it's not nine to five. You're totally weather dependent and when the weather and land allow you to do something you've got to do it otherwise you're not going to make money so that philosophy does tell beautifully with the army he's been trying for quite a few years and i've been helping him as best as can to find people that have the same philosophy to work for him and the only way we've managed to keep his business evolving is actually use uh, serving royals that are on uh, leave that want a little bit of cash that work in, in that level or ex-royals that have got the same mentality and it's actually staggeringly simple. My contractor, AD, he wants to start work at five o'clock in the morning. He wants people that are there mentally and physically ready to go, got all the right kit that he's told them and he's hired many civilians and they've all turned up, they want a fag break, they want a coffee break, they can't cope with the hours, they can't cope with the not exactly intensity, but the duration of the workload. So that is a direct transferable skill coming on from all the values and skills that are within the army. And the, the gentleman down in Lincolnshire, I was amazed to find out he was a royal as well. And it just explains a lot because he turns up with the right kit at the right time and he's a very big spray contractor. So I'll get onto it later on. A big part of agronomy is weed, pest and disease control. Uh, and he makes that happen. Once I've made the technical decision, he makes that happen. And again, that's a great philosophy to take from the military. If you don't make things happen, you, A, you're going to be in trouble. B, well, let's not go to B, but you have to make things happen because that's what your job is. The other thing that I found very difficult from the transition from the military to civilian life, and spookily, my son's found a very similar thing uh, in New Zealand, is that within the military, you, you have you retained a rank, you retained a qualification. It doesn't matter where within the pecking order you are. That means you've all been through a similar training to get to that point. Within that rank structure, for instance, there's going to be a variation on a the theme. Some people will be better than others, but you have that same skill set. The thing that drives me crackers in, in previous incarnations that I'll tell you about in a minute is so-called managers couldn't manage their way out of a paper bag and how on earth they've kept their job, I've never known. 
but I find that very frustrating because a manager as a title doesn't really mean anything. So just a little bit about me. Um, I, I was pretty strange as a child and probably pretty strange now and only found out a dozen or so years ago with part of my uh, PTSD restructuring, they've actually got Asperger's. Uh, when I was younger at school, I was just, I have no idea how to learn at all. So I turned up when I should and hadn't got a clue what most people were talking about. That's how life is, that's how life was. Thankfully, uh, I can train dogs for a living. I loved interacting with dogs and animals. My father was a vet. We lived on a farming estate, which was Lordington Park. And I was pretty feral, thoroughly enjoyed life, but no idea what I wanted to do when I left school because didn't get any qualifications. And there's a chap I met, and this comes back to what Rupert was saying about a mentor who'd always trained me to train dogs, chatting to him. Turned out he was a sergeant in the machine gun corps, got stitched up quite badly across his stomach, should have been very dead, should have stopped smoking, should have stopped drinking, did neither of those. And he said, you'll enjoy doing stuff in the army, but don't join the infantry, do go and acquire a skill. So, okay, sounds a plan. Uh, so I went and did that. I joined the Royal Engineers at 16, and without a doubt, it's the best thing I ever did because I suddenly learned I could learn and I learned what my brain needs to acquire knowledge. Loved every minute of it. Uh, didn't really fit in because I found that I was a little bit too outspoken, shall we say, um, which didn't go down very well. But later on, I uh, transferred a little bit like Rupert and uh, going to Santos, but that's another story to get to. But just love the whole process of learning, acquiring skills and making a contribution. Once I got 18, got posted to my unit, they were all on excise in Kenya. I uh, wasn't quite sure what to do as a notice went up on the board, go down for a Royal Engineer Train and a Royal Engineer uh, Commando training, become part of 5-9 Engineer Commando. Uh, in my naivety, I thought, why not? Uh, my only advantage was that, A, I didn't really fit in, but I've always been good at shooting and good at doing outdoor things. So after the more or less constant beatings, which are beastings, apologies, not beatings, beastings, that never really bothered me. I evolved quite well past that, much to everyone's surprise, including all my corporals. But as I say, that bloody-minded attitude follows through to everything. Uh, got posted straight to Northern Ireland, did two back-to-back -to -back tours, got damaged, medical discharged. No idea what to do after that because no qualifications. And I soon realised being able to run fast, carry heavy weights, clear a minefield, it's not really transferable. But what I also realized quite quickly is the determination to achieve is. So, talked my way into a job at the brewery, pallet handling, just literally lifting heavy weights, loading lorries. Um, very soon realized that because I turned up looking like I belonged, was gonna do something, and if there's nothing to do, pick a broom up. Fairly standard philosophy, ended up running the warehouse distribution fleet, loved all of that. Then they wanted to shut the brewery, so I went into poultry production. I ended up as a manager there, had about 500 people work for me, hated every minute of it. I was very good at what I do because people have always been happy to follow me, which I've always found slightly bizarre, but that's me. I just realized I was indoors for 14 hours a day. I wasn't seeing my young children. I was hardly seeing my dogs. It, it just wasn't a life and not what I wanted to do. So I uh, had a bit of a sense of humor failure with my autocratic millionaire boss. Um, gave my notice in. Uh, terminated my marriage more or less on the spot, but that's a whole other story as they say. Then decided, right, what do I want to do? Well, this goes back to when I was younger. I love food. I love the, the history of food, which is something I've studied for years. Creating food, getting good food out of the soil. And when I went to New Zealand a few years ago to visit my son, I got offered a job in viticulture, which oh, I possibly would have loved, but it didn't happen for various reasons, decided not to. But I soon realized that if you just take a Pinot Noir grape, the difference in flavor from a Pinot Noir grape growing in different regions of New Zealand under relatively the same climatic conditions was staggering. Uh, and that fueled my interest even more. Uh, and anyway, cut a long story short, when I was deciding what to do, I thought I love food. So went to the local agriculture college, asked if I could join a course, 
were surprised to be accepted and then soon realized that again, the ability to turn up on time with the right piece of paper and a pen it is pretty unique amongst the people I was with. And then while I was working there, <clears throat> I thought, right, I just got totally enthused and carried away. Uh, there was a crop research company there that carried out research into crop growth and development. And basically they trialed all the far things farmers <clears throat> couldn't afford to do because there's a financial risk. Absolutely loved it because I had an insatiable appetite for learning. And sorry, then I realized sorry, sorry, the same thing. Sorry, Jonathan, can I interrupt you? Can you yep. lean forward a bit, please? You're disappearing oh, into sorry. your background. In fact, you might want to change it. It's uh, oh, your face is becoming covered in soil, which is oh, well, well, that, that's <laughs> part of the course, but yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm not quite sure how to change that, for which I apologize, but I'll uh, certainly change that in the future rather than okay. faff about now. All right, okay, all right. fine, okay. Um, I, I wouldn't have a clue how to do it, sorry. Um, yeah, anyway, and uh, so, uh on the back of that, I found out that there's this strange occupation called an agronomist. And basically, in simple terms, an agronomist is a farm, is a doctor for farmers' crops. So organized weed, pest, and disease control. And I don't know if you can see this if the background's playing up, but this thing is called the UK Pesticide Guide. And it's the 2020 version. You can see how thick it is. There's thousands of agrochemicals in there, uh, and it's my job to know the vast majority of them, how to use them legally, and how to help farmers use them. So, what an agronomist basically does is find out what the problem is in the field, advises the farmer what to do, because farms have evolved into highly technical organizations now, whether they're arable or um, mixed farms or uh, just farming beasts, in other words, sheep, cattle, or deer, but the arable side is highly technical. So getting timings right is, is making a contribution to the farmer's growth margins. Within agriculture itself, there's, there's two types of agronomists. There's an independent agronomist, which is what I am, uh, and there's a commercial agronomist, which works for an ag chem company agrochemical company, sorry. So the agrochemical company supplies all the inputs for the farmers and makes a considerable amount of money on the farmers' backs because they don't have the technical knowledge to, without being rude, to know any different, which is why I work for myself because I advise on all technical aspects. If we then look at the, the actual definition of agronomy, it's soil science and crop production. That's generally been lost with the Green Revolution of the 70s and 80s, where there was a solution to nearly every problem in a bag or a can. And that's very much like society these days. That's what everybody seems to want is a quick fix. We all know with all the COVID restrictions that can't get hold of most things, but fairly spookily, just go onto Amazon and there's not much we can't get hold of, which is great, but also very sad. Well, as a society, agriculture is a little bit like that. And it's why I've evolved over the last 10, 15 years into a soil scientist, because soil is the bedrock without uh, any pun intended of agriculture and farmers have forgotten how to interact with their soil. And if we look at the agriculture bill that came in this year, I was sadly excited about that. Unfortunately, it's gonna change a lot of things for farmers by 2027, but it's environmental land management. It's not a payment protection scheme, however we want to call it, however it's evolved from Europe, that's going. So farmers are going to be paid for pub, what's called public goods. It, it's an appalling phrase, but that's what they've decided on. So farms that can demonstrate that they're increasing the quality of the air and water on their farm, demonstrate that there's a thriving wildlife, and from my perspective, you're increasing soil health, are going to be paid a supplementary payment for over and above what they do. It's quite scary for a lot of farmers because arable crops are in the ground for approximately 10 months. The upfront costs of putting an arable crop in the ground are huge. To grow a crop of potatoes, you're spending approximately 10,000 pounds an acre, and I'll come back to that in a minute, just to establish that crop. So there's very few industries where 
you spend a fortune that you borrowed from the bank with no guarantee of return or guarantee that you're going to get something to sell at the end of it because it's all weather dependent. However accomplished you are, it's weather dependent. So arable production is quite a, a fraught industry and you've got to get used to borrowing a lot of money, but also being expert at risk management. And risk management is what everybody in the forces have to do at one sort of level or another. It doesn't matter what level in the organization you are, that's what we do, it's risk management. And that's where you can make a great contribution to agriculture. And as Rupert's already said, we're talking about food production. The COVID epidemic has reminded everybody that actually we need to reacquaint ourselves with food. So there's going to be more and more demand for good quality food that actually tastes nutritious. The Canadians have developed a PCR type scanner that actually scans the nutritional content of crops. And they're looking at paying their farmers on producing a more nutritious crop rather than a big heap. So farmers at the moment get paid by the ton of yield they produce, but most crops these days without being rude to farmers have got very low nutritional value and it's why we're getting so many problems in society. Uh, it's just how we've evolved. It's been simplistically evolved really for people that are selling commodities and farmers need to take a little bit more control, quite how, but they need to ask the questions. Uh, just coming back to a few bits of terminology before I forget, an acre is 40 metres by 100. It was designated as the land uh, ploughman with one furrow plough and an oxen could plough in a day. That governs everything within agriculture and it's what everybody tends to talk about, even though a hectare, which is 100 metres by 100 metres, is actually what we farm. So just make sure the technology uh, and just terminology rather. Uh, and the other thing is that just bear in mind that it drives me mad when you hear it on the press because people are talking about pesticides, meaning something that kills insects. Uh, a pesticide is actually a fungicide, a graminicide, which kills grass, a broadleaf weed control, which is a herbicide or an insecticide. So again, if you're talking to farmers, just make sure you don't drop into the bear trap of talking about pesticides. Uh, just bear that one in mind, please. And just thinking about how to become an agronomist, because I realise I'm rattling on a little bit, which is par for the course, because talking is what I do. Um, I lecture on uh, agriculture up to master's degree level, by the way, and uh, that's something that, coming back to the portfolio of jobs that we were talking about earlier, I soon realised that my work was pretty seasonal. I started work for an ag chem company, hated it because I don't like their integrity, went self-employed and suddenly realized it's not easy to pick up farms, however good you are. So I started uh, teaching, got teaching qualifications uh, and then evolved into master degree agriculture, which does help. But as I say, a portfolio of jobs is very important. So just thinking about how to become an agronomist, that the best thing to do is if that's something uh, you like technical aspects, you like being outdoors in all weather, you like being what I call a, a solution provider. Uh, it takes a long time to learn as much as I do about soil, but uh, if, if you have the, the willingness to learn, then that's no problem. But you need to be going to speak to some of the agrochemical companies. There's hundreds of websites out there, so BASF, Corteva, and to, to name but a few, Adama, um, anybody needs any help with that pointing in the right direction, more than happy to do it. Uh, I love being outdoors and being a solution provider. I don't mind being indoors the rest of the time, but I like being able to manage my own time. Just to say that to become an agronomist in this country, you've got to be something that's called BASIS qualified. Uh, BASIS stands for British Agrochemical Supply Industry Standard. It's an incredibly long, complex qualification. I nearly killed myself by teaching it to myself when I did it many years ago because that's what I wanted to do. The problem with it is, is there's very little of its long answer questions or a traditional exam. You, you have to have three 10 minute Viva panels with industry experts on given topics, for instance, arable production. So, time had gone off. Um, and 
there's nowhere to hide when you stood in front of somebody for 10 minutes, which is why if that's the route you want to go down, it's probably best to speak to an agrochemical company and elicit their support because the ability to turn up on time represent anybody's company because, well, you know how to turn up on parade effectively and can speak to people is always good. So I've taken my 20 minutes up, Fiona, unless anybody wants to know any more, I'll stop talking if that's all right. That's fantastic, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Um, fascinating story and um, and fascinating work, and um, and so much um, so much future in this because, as you say, people are starting to understand more broadly um, how neglected our soils are, and that you can't yeah. just reach for a can. Um, and I think for those who are interested in getting into this space, thank you very much for touching on um, environmental land management scheme Elm or Elms mm. as it's referred very important. To. Yeah, um, really important. And um, um, they, there are I've got um, some links to people who are conducting some of the DEFRA uh, trials um, into various aspects of Elms, um, and I'm directly involved in um, one of the. Um, technology um, demonstrators that we're working with the Ordnance Survey to look at mapping solutions um, so that uh, farmers and landowners and agronomists like yourself will be able to map directly um, onto a national database using your phone on the land um, mm. and in this by the same token um, particularly in an advisory role as yourself being able to stand out on that farm and see what other people have put on there without having to go back to the office or draw down um, maps from somewhere else. And this is the, the level of te you know, technology that's being brought into going backwards to forgotten skills you mentioned about managing from below ground level up, but doing so in a modern way um, and making use of technology. So I'm really glad you mentioned that um, and notwithstanding um the public money for public goods which we don't have to go have time to go further into so that's um, really fantastic thank you jonathan i'm so so glad we were able to get um that um from you but we do have to press on because we've got so many more other w wonderful people to exactly. hear exactly um so thank you. thank you thanks so um i'm delighted um to welcome patrick kraus um crofts and crofting are a peculiar uh peculiar not peculiar sorry I'll do that again. Crofts and crofting are a peculiarly Scottish land ownership and tenancy arrangement, although there are some points of commonality with smallholders elsewhere. I'm so um, very, very pleased that the chief executive of the Scottish Crofting Federation, Patrick Krause, has agreed to join us this afternoon to give us a truly expert insight to this uniquely Scottish way of life. Um, thank you very much indeed, Patrick. Um, do feel free to, to share slides. I know you've got a few. Um, when you're when you're ready, thank you. Okay, that's that's great. Thank you very much um, for this, Fiona. Um, I I think the um, <clears throat> the term peculiar is actually quite <laughs> regularly applied to crofting legislation. Ah, we can we can talk about the legislation a little bit, but but not in depth it, it, because it is quite strange. Um, I would just like to quickly first say that um, I was brought up on a farm, not a croft, um, not a farm, <laughs> why did I say that? I was brought up on a small holding um, in Bedfordshire and I've lived in Scotland for, um, the, for most of my life actually now. And, um, and I, I was working in an international organization with small holders and then 17 years ago, um, started working with the crofters um, because of the connection with other worldwide small holdings. And I have remained with the crofters ever since. So I, what I intend to do now is go very quickly through some slides just to sort of give a flavor of, um, of crofting. I'm going to try and load this up. So hopefully you can all see the slides. Great. And Fiona is giving me a thumbs up there. Um, I should say, incidentally, that, that I have never been in the services. Um, 
not that this is relevant to this, but but you know, looking at the program and and I I realised that a lot of people that have been speaking um, are ex-service people, and I've never been in the services. I very nearly I very nearly did, <laughs> but didn't. Um, anyway, so the SCF is the Scottish Crofting Federation. Um, we're a union. We represent crofters and crofting. Uh, so we do sort of two main streams. One is that we represent crofters, we lobby, um, we respond to policy directives. Um, for example, the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, creates lots of issues. Um, and we'll be switching from the Common Agricultural Policy to a Scottish Agricultural Policy very shortly, and that in itself will create a lot of issues. And so we have to stand up for crofters and make sure that their voice is heard. Um, we're based in Kyle of Lokalsh, which is a village on the mainland where the bridge goes over to the Isle of Skye. So a very, very brief historic overview is that there was the 1745 rebellion and the Battle of Culloden. And this is significant because it led to the collapse of the clans and the clan system. Um, landowners at that time were to a great extent involved in overseas um, exploitation and they brought these sort of practices back to, to Scotland and started to clear the land. And so they cleared the, the tenant farmers off making way for sheep, funnily enough, for the textile industry that was emerging then. And so a lot of crofters were pushed out to the coast or to the islands. And um, many, of course, emigrated and went over to the new world. Um, there, there were land wars, they were called um, the crofting wars. They weren't wars like, um, you know, wars, but they were small, small, but very um, intense skirmishes over, over what was happening um, with the exploitation of crofters. And it led to political intervention. Um, a commission was set up called the Napier Commission and they sort of traveled throughout the crofting areas, taking evidence. And this led to the 1886 Crofting Act. And um, that act has sort of been amended several times over the years, but it's still basically the act that governs crofting. And um, the legislation that is used is, um, is enacted in regulation and the regulator is the Crofting Commission and they're based in Inverness. And that sort of led to the creation of modern crofting and it still is a regulated system. And this is how it is fundamentally very different from small holdings and indeed farming. It is the, it's a regulated system. Um, this is the Strath of Kilgonan in um, Sutherland. And I just show, thought I'd show you this slide to illustrate what happened in the clearances. Um, so, so this was a well-populated um, Strath. It's very fertile. There were a lot of tenant farmers on it, tenant um, farmers as they were called before the act. Um, and now there is just a church and a cottage that belongs to a gamekeeper. So what is a croft? Um, as I said, it's, it's a piece of land. People sometimes think that a croft is a house. It sort of gets misinterpreted mis a bit there. A, cro a croft is a piece of land and um, it's under crofting regulation. So, so the main croft, as you would see in, the, in that picture there, 
um, the main croft, the croft itself is the piece of land that's around the house. And this can be sort of any, any size. There, there are crofts that are only an acre. Um, they go up to a few very large crofts. Of, um, I think there's, there's a couple in Sky that are in the hundreds of acres. But generally, they're around um, between five and ten acres, and that's the invite. And and they also have a share in grazings, which are normally held in common, um, hence being called common grazings. Um, the regulation that crofts exist under have certain restrictions the um, obligation upon crofters is that they must reside on or near their croft and they must use the croft so they must cultivate it or put it to purposeful use um, but in return the legislation protects crofters so whilst the majority of crofters are still tenants they have heritable tenancies and this means that they're secure and their, their rent is very low and is governed by the land court. Um, the new crofting register that I've written on there is just to say that the, there's a register that's held by the crofting commission and um, the mapping of crofts has really only just begun and that is put onto a register held by registers of Scotland. And like I said, the Scottish Land Court is the, um, the body that crofters can go to if they feel that they're um, being exploited in any way. So this is a map showing where the crofting areas are. Um, as you can see, the Western Isles the Highlands and the Northern Islands um, are all under crofting tenure. The reason it stopped there was because the landlords, um, after the Napier Commission, this was this was a, a protection that was supposed to be rolled out across the whole of Scotland, but the landlords um, objected more and more because they didn't want tenants to have this protection, and eventually the rollout was stopped on that line that you can see. So something that we're fighting for is that crofting is eventually rolled out across the whole of Scotland. There's some facts and figures here. I won't go through all of them. Um, I'll just pick a couple of things. There's um, just over 18,000 crofts. Um, if you look on the commission website, it says more than that, but that's just because of a technicality. There's actually just over 18,000 crofts. Um, there's about somewhere between 13 and 16,000 registered crofters. Um, so they're on the register held by the commission. Um, and this equates to it's in the order of 33,000 family members. Um, I think a significant point is that 65% of households on the islands are crofting households. So it's, it's very much um, a way of living on the islands. So most, uh, most crofters are tenants still, as I said, and um, a relatively small proportion, 2,000 or so, are owner-occupiers. They're still... This thing about owner owner occupancy, though, people think that it's that it's referring to freehold because people have bought their crofts. It actually isn't. The the crofts are still regulated pieces of land, and um, if somebody has exercised their right to buy, they've bought the landlord's rights. So it was a mechanism to get past obstructive landlords. Um, there's a great deal of um, different land types and uses of crofts. This is in the Western Isles. This is on the Western shores. Um, it's called Macha, 
and it's um, a shell-based loam soil, so it's very fertile, very good for growing grass because of the lime content, and, um, and it's known for its wild flowers as well. And it's good for potatoes, and it's used mainly for grazing cattle. This is in Shetland. Um, this is a farm just illustrating sort of a mix of things. So, so these people um, grow predominantly Shetland things. So they grow um, bear barley, which is um, an old variety of barley that's grown on the islands, and Shetland kale, that's the dark green um, crop you can see there. And they keep Shetland poultry and Shetland sheep. Um, he makes fiddles, <laughs> a very traditional family. Um, it's a great, it's a great wee croft that we take people to visit sometimes. Um, you know, if we have um, dignitaries or whatever that, that we're taking out, then then we'll take them to um, this croft. This um, is in Sky, I believe, and this shows um, sort of a typical layout of, of crofts. Um, as I said, crofts, uh, something that's very important about crofts is, is that it retains populations and communities um, in these remote areas. And so you can see here, this is a township. So, so there's a whole number of crofts here. If you see the equivalent sort of area in the southern uplands, um, you know, which is south of, of Edinburgh and Glasgow, the, the, the scenery might look fairly similar to this, except there won't be any of these houses because crofting legislation has kept communities in place, whereas in non-crofting areas, the land has tended to be amalgamated into very large farms and the trouble with a very large farm is it supports only, um, usually, only one family. So, and this is um, another croft that, that isn't livestock based um, predominantly. Um, she's growing salads and herbs, but um, also has, if you see where she is, in the, in the background there, you can see a shelter belt and she keeps some um, cattle in the shelter belt, so so she fattens calves in the um, in the woodland there. Cattle actually do very well under trees. Um, by far the largest output of crofts is of course um, store animals. So this is calves and and lambs that, that go to the market and um, are generally fattened. The last part of the finishing is done on richer land um, in the lowlands. So most crofters are part-time, um, well I say that's the, that's the wrong word really, um, most crofters do other things as well as crofting. So um, crofting takes up a lot of their time but they'll also have, have other things that, that they're doing. Um, so they're sort of mega full time and they'll be involved in all sorts that you find in the Highlands and Islands, you know, fishing. A lot of crofters will be involved in fishing. Um, a lot of crofters will be involved in tourism in, in some, some way, um, maybe having tourist accommodation on their, on their crofts. Um, and then they're involved in the things that we're all involved in, you know, education, health, building. Um, IT, there are more people starting to work from home. Um, notwithstanding the pandemic, of course, we're all working from home generally, but um, there are more people that are able to do so because of the, the technology, which is quite an interesting shift in, in what's happening in the Highlands and Islands. Um, arts and crafts are popular with crofters selling selling arts and crafts. Um, crofters will be involved in local government, in um, the council. I think the Highland Council is the largest employer in the Highlands. 
um, and many crofters involved in the oil industry, of course. But the important thing about crofting is that no matter what other things people are doing, um, which may be quite um, fragile or seasonal occupations, the point about the croft is that it gives this foothold and um, a certain security. So future opportunities, something that interestingly that COVID has, has um, brought out is people wanting shorter food chains, people wanting to be able to buy food direct from crofts. Um, so local markets are, they, before the pandemic, local markets were doing um, well. Um, the whole food movement has moved on considerably just in, in the time that I've been involved in this. I've seen huge changes. Um, so this idea of having farmers markets and crop markets and direct selling is really growing. And the pandemic has um, made the importance of this more and more apparent. Even, even government people are starting to take, take notice of this now. So I think that's about it as a very short, intense introduction to crofting. If you want to find out more about us, the Federation, and what we do, um, or, or about crofting, we have quite a lot of stuff um, just generally about crofting on our website, which you can find at crofting.org. If you have any questions, I'm open to questions now, I think. And I'll stay to the end of this session um, if there's a discussion question period at the end, I'll still be here. So if you think of something that you want to ask me, um, I'll be around. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Patrick. Uh, uh, we will um, we will definitely ask for for questions at the end of the session just to uh, to keep us on track. Um, it, as much as as possible um so thank you very much it's really great points and uh, um you know i'm loving this theme that's coming out from today of the pandemic creating even more opportunities and, and from you i've i've slightly bent your quote slightly but i hope you'll go with this that pandemic has made even governments take notice of the lands which uh, i assume you're happy with yeah which, yes which is great Okay, so we're going to move on um, to uh, to welcome Jenny back um, again. We heard from her earlier, um, but she's kindly going to uh, give us a second session on the um, on her expert view of aquaculture. Um, and this is a subject we've never covered in uh, in an insight day before. So I'm looking very much uh, I'm very much looking forward to this, Jenny. Um, <laughs> Please educate me and uh, and inform everyone else. Thank you very much. <laughs> no problem, Fiona. Um, just bring up my slides here. Um, just to give you a wee bit of background in uh, Lantra and uh, in our office in Perth, we all have uh, industries that we are the industry contact for. And um, I have two. I have game and wildlife management and aquaculture. So not controversial topics at all <laughs> when we're talking about these uh, industries in Scotland. But um, but yeah. So. Um, here today talking about aquaculture and uh, hopefully in the next 20 minutes or so um, cover these things here. So what is aquaculture? If you haven't heard about it before, why work in aquaculture, some of the jobs, what's the training like, which I'm sure will be interesting to everybody and how can I find out more? There is a video I'm going to play as well at one point. So I'm hoping everyone's bandwidth allows you to see that. It's only a couple of minutes. So. Okay, so what is aquaculture? Uh, much like agriculture is field growing, aquaculture just means growing in the water. So um, it's fin fish cultivation, so um, Atlantic salmon, trout and other fish species as well. Um, these are the, the main ones in Scotland though are the salmon and the trout. Uh, shellfish cultivation uh, in Scotland very much mussels, oysters and scallops. And aquatic plants, so your seaweeds. 
um, finfish producers in Scotland. Uh, there is some smaller um, producers, but mostly we are talking about multinational salmon producers, um, which also would bring with it the opportunity to travel. So, um, you know, they might have sites in Canada, um, over in Norway. Um, so um, the, the, positive, the benefits of being multinationals. Shellfish tends to be smaller, more local producers, um, but um, you know, that's, uh, that's something to be aware of as well. Um, seaweed uh, is mostly hand harvested in Scotland, but we're now beginning to look at opportunities and potential for growth in the farming of seaweed. It's something that's starting to, to, um, to take off really. Um, in uh, the finfish uh, aquaculture, you have a few stages. You have the freshwater, which are usually in cages or tanks more inland, uh, where you grow the eggs of the salmon up until they're juvenile fish. And then they get to a certain size and they're farmed out in the sea. So they move out to the pens as they get larger. Uh, Scotland, um, the marine fish sites are, the farms are mainly on the west or north of the mainland coast, um, also in the Western Orkney and Shetland Islands, and can be a big employer in the area. And so it's helping to sustain the economic growth, um, you know, in rural and, com and coastal communities. Next year marks the 50th anniversary of the first, cult um, first commercially harvested, should I say, farm salmon in Scotland, so a relatively new industry. Um, Scotland's currently the largest producer in the EU and we're the third largest globally. Uh, we produced 162,000 tonnes of fin fish in 2018. Uh, Scottish um, farm salmon is Scotland's top food expert, uh, export, sorry, export, and fresh salmon is exported to over 50 countries. So why work in aquaculture? Aquaculture is the fastest growing food producing sector in the world. So it produces healthy, nutritious, high protein food. Um, it's got a low carbon and a low water use. More edible meat is produced per tonne of feed um, used um, compared to other farm species. Um, aquaculture directly employs over 6,000 people, with over half of those working in aquaculture processing. However, if you look across the supply chain, um, the industry actually contributes to 11,700 jobs in Scotland. And as I said earlier, that's mainly in rural and remote areas. Um, there was a strategy for aquaculture that was released a few years ago called Aquaculture Growth to 2030. And they had mentioned that by 2030, um, the amount of jobs that could be supported by the sector would reach 18,000. So in the next 10 years, there's a potential for um, many jobs. And a report commissioned in last year by the Scottish Salmon Producers um, to find the um, key figures for Scottish Salmon found that the average wage um, of someone working in the salmon industry was £34,000. Uh, Scottish Government's Economic Recovery Implementation Plan um, has highlighted that aquaculture is essential for the country's ability to recover from the economic impacts of the COVID pandemic. So um, what are some of the roles? Um, for the time that's allowed, I've very much concentrated on fin fish farming opportunities and the associated skills that are required. So if we start here with some of the jobs I've noted, uh, freshwater operatives, that's, as I was saying earlier, is um, the freshwater sites looking after the um, smaller fish from eggs to juvenile fish. Duties could include, um, you know, looking after the eggs, turning the eggs, making sure that they're, um, that they're healthy and um, just making sure that the fish are, um, are growing so that they're ready to get put out to sea. Uh, and then that would move on to fish farm technician roles. Um, that's husbandry roles, so looking after the fish, responsible for jobs such as feeding or grading the fish. That's when you sort them into similar sized uh, fish when they're getting put in the pens, so they're all in the same uh, the same size fish are in the same size pens. Uh, you're maintaining the nets and equipment and you're checking the fish for disease. So quite a hands-on role. Workboat skippers, um, very much as, as you would think, it's looking after the boats that are used for harvesting the stock, uh, taking care of the navigation, weather forecasting and um, the equipment maintenance there. 
Harvest operatives, uh, they maintain all the equipment and machinery used in um, harvesting the fish. Um, so you will have a food hygiene uh, responsibility as well as adhering to health and safety and animal welfare recommendations. And then when you're in uh, aquaculture, um, you know, you get the um, opportunities to progress while you're there. So looking at the more management roles, they're the assistant or site farm managers. Um, that's more record keeping. So you need to have good planning skills, IT skills and be flexible to the demands of the role there. Uh, site managers, farm managers would have the responsibility, uh, overall responsibility, should I say, for stock management, personnel management, staff development and the promotion of health and safety in the workplace. Um, so you must be able to demonstrate commitment to the safety and welfare of staff, um, to the uh, livestock that's within your control and to the environment and the local community and beyond. So I've got a short video here, hearing from Kirk. He is a farm manager in Sky with uh, one of the, um, the companies called Maui. So let's see if we can get this to work. So the weather on Sky, I would say <laughs> all in one day. <laughs> so I think like you'll be, you come in and it's lovely and then by the time you go home, it's torrential. But, uh, when the weather is good, there is absolutely no complaints. You know, it's a lovely place to work. He doesn't mind the weather. <laughs> My job is the farm manager of a farm on the Isle of Skye, and I started part time at the age of seventeen. And you're just you're kind of you're doing your daily stuff. You're mortaring, you're feeding, you things like that, and. Slowly, as time goes on, you get given a little bit more responsibility with jobs, and you get introduced a lot more into fish health or net cleaning or you know maintenance of machinery. And then from there, you you've got the opportunity to work your way through the farm technician ranks, and then hopefully into management, which is thankfully what happened. And uh, that's just the anaesthetic that we use for making sure the fish doesn't jump around, flap about, and escape. They will come back round. In terms of actual training through SAKE, I really enjoyed that. Uh, the junior executive programme, that was brilliant. I think things like that can make a huge difference to people coming through as well. Not all jobs are just one thing. It's As I've found out, you come into fish farming or aquaculture or the industry, there is so many things you can do. So like, just don't be afraid if the job isn't what, you, what you're looking for, because it might lead to the job you're looking for. Thankfully, I, I, I did just jump in and try it, but that's what the advice I would give to others as well. Dig in and just go for it. Okay, um, then moving on, I've got a wee bit here about engineering. Um, aquaculture engineering can be the construction and maintenance of effective production systems that provide the best environment for whatever cultured species you're working with. Engineers will work with the aquaculture biologists and make the systems more productive and sustainable using technologies, equipment and different techniques. The engineers will design and develop new production facilities. They'll maybe make the pens and cages that hold the fish and uh, also look at the feeding and the fish processing equipment. So one of these things would be recirculating systems um, constructed by engineers to provide a high quality of water that promotes the rapid growth of the fish. Um, and um, it will be, um, also the technology that um, cleans and conditions the water before putting it back into the system. So pumps, biofil biofilters and aerators. Um, a lot of competition uh, from other industries for engineers. It's something that uh, all industries have said that there's, uh, there's a need for. Um, so um, just to bear that in mind as well. And I've just popped a wee bit here about other opportunities because um, I think it's it's worth noting that even though it's fish farming, like like any industry, there is that's that's not just then 
the end of the story, there's other um, opportunities that are available within uh, organisations, uh, fish farming organisations. So you've got IT, fantastic opportunities there. Um, I've written about new product development. That's basically when they develop new food products, they take the salmon or the fish products and then make new products that are sold in uh, supermarkets. So um, people have to, you have to be a people person, you have to follow consumer trends, you do some research um, both on the products and the potential market and um, it's very much overseeing a process bringing a new product to market so you've got to have some great project management skills there. Uh, processing, that's very much about uh, more of the factory and the processing of the food. Um, you'll have roles there such as dispatch supervisors. We were talking about logistics earlier on. So um, a dispatch supervisor has to organise the resources so that deliveries can and services can be carried out in the most timely manner and um, make sure that goods can go where they're meant to be when. Um, so that I, as well as that, you've obviously got the, the processing um, opportunities there as well on the on the shop floor. Uh, I've noted commercial there, sales consultants, um, you know, they work closely with customers throughout the sales process, as well as providing the sale, sales team with administration support. Um, a, an important part of commercial work would be following up with customers, so having that good, um, you know, engaging customer service skills, making sure that people are satisf satisfied with their products purchased, um, so a lot of people's skills there. Um, finance, uh, a lot of finance roles um, responsible for the purchasing of the best quality equipment or goods or services um, and accountants would be there um, there's also HR opportunities very much of these um, these jobs um, these roles you know um, learning development is a big area in HR you'll have factory trainers uh, in processing that are responsible for delivering induction programs or ensuring a uh, company compliance with standards and um, they plan and organize and deliver training in things like food safety um, health and safety and things like awareness training so there's a lot of opportunities in HR there and then, of course, we've got HSE, health and safety. Um, health and safety advisors will use their knowledge and their skills to promote a positive health and safety culture in the workplace. So carrying out risk assessments um, and considering how risks can be reduced in the workplace. Um, so that's that's another big role within the, um, the aquaculture companies. So um, to talk about training. Uh, and now I've popped this slide up. I don't want anyone to think, though, that um, to be put off by this diagram. It's just um, so that we've got a visual there. But I, I think one of the things that I would like to get across is you don't have to have previous experience if you want to go into aquaculture. As long as you have an interest in fish husbandry, you can work in a small team. Uh, you're prepared to work outdoors uh, and all weathers, as we've seen in Kirk's video, um, then you'll do well. Many fin fish companies do though use the uh, modern apprenticeship frameworks, which I've put um, in this diagram. It's under vocational qualifications. Um, they'll use uh, the frameworks, the modern apprenticeship training um, as part of their development of their staff because there's the there's three levels of qualification there, the level five, the level seven, and then what we call a technical apprenticeship, which is going on to a management level qualification. The technical apprenticeship in aquaculture is actually equivalent of a degree. It's an SCQF level nine. Um, so just to show that parity of esteem and qualifications. Um, as I mentioned earlier, modern apprentices um, are not necessarily school leavers, and that's really evident in aquaculture. We find that most aquaculture learners are in the 30 plus um, age range. We work closely with the industry to make sure qualifications meet the training needs, and it's just that aquaculture has, um, has really embraced the, the modern apprenticeship frameworks as a progression pathway for staff. Um, it might be that someone has worked with the company for years and just doesn't have the qualification to back their knowledge up. Um, so they use the modern apprenticeships there. Uh, the good thing I would say about modern apprenticeships is that they're work-based and evidence-based. So you're doing it on the job. Um, Industry standard training will be will take place along with the modern apprenticeship, so you um, get what we call enhancements, and that could be thing like power boat training, health and safety, crane and forklift operations. Um, all these qualifications are paid for by the company, um, because it is legislative training. You have to have that training. So um, you know companies will invest in you uh, if you're a new come a new entrant into aquaculture. Um, the the uh, they do a lot of training. 
Um, on farms, I think just to get a feel for, for um, aquaculture, on farm staff are usually full time. They'll work on a rota basis. You will have weekends cover and you will have additional hours um, to accommodate the needs of the business. Um, if there is uh, anything over um, overtime, it's well paid overtime. And bonuses are also commonplace in aquaculture, depending on how your farm is um, producing. With the sites being quite rural and remote, uh, most of the companies offer relocation support or accommodation allowances provided, uh, with some of the companies actually having their own uh, housing that they'll use for employees. And if some of the positions require a driver's license, if you don't have that, um, the companies will actually pay for you to get put through your driving license and your driving test. So that's, uh, that's always a, a big thing when you're going into a new company. Um, so just moving on, if you want to find out more, this is our Lantra Careers page. Um, and we have um, we have the link there. I'm happy to um, to share that in the chat box so everyone has that as well. Um, we we have all our industries that we work with. We have pages for for all those industries. Um, for example, if I click on the next one, um, this is a picture of one of the um, job roles in aquaculture. But you can find out more about the job. There'll be a case study, a wee bit of information around salary, and then going on to the qualification and skills that I've mentioned um, just in the last slide. Another thing we have is what we're calling our, it's our aquaculture Prezi resource. This is something I worked with with the aquaculture companies to produce. Um, you can go in and you can see the different job types that are in these uh, areas in aquaculture. Obviously, I've just touched on a few today, but um, you can see there just even from the titles of some of the um, areas that the jobs are in. Um, it's a, it's, there's a lot of opportunities in aquaculture. So where to find the jobs if it's something you're interested in. Um, these are some of the finfish companies and uh, they um, will have a vacancies page that they all use. Uh, they'll, they'll post or type their um, job vacancies on. Um, if you're looking for shellfish vacancies, usually the best thing to do, as I said, they're usually smaller. But if you go through the Association of Scottish Shellfish Growers, they can usually um, link you up with a grower and um, you can get some experience there. And a lot of the bigger companies are now using high jobs um, to advertise through um, as well. So, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, that's, it's good to, to have a look there. I think um, it's also worth noting that even though I said earlier that the West Coast, Highlands and Islands um, are where most of the farming jobs are, and most of these companies will have their head offices, um, you know, more inland, uh, a lot on the central belt. So we've got Scottish Salmon Company are in Edinburgh, Dawn Fresh are in Uddingston, and Maui have Resyth uh, as their head office. So. So that's me there. Thank you very much, Jenny. That's a, a, a rapid uh, tour around what's clearly a, a huge sector and uh, ripe with opportunities. Um, a lot of uh, project management skills um, in, in the um, military community, and that's um, a sector I don't think very many people have considered at all. Um, uh, however, a um, question in the chat indicates that someone might be thinking about it um, <laughs> in terms of Angus just asking um, when one is considering setting up a new uh, farm how does one go about getting um, the necessary permissions to do that with Rupert suggesting the RPID office may be the place to start but I don't know if you were able to to make some wider comments about uh, new entrants perhaps establishing their own farm um, on their own um, land or uh, at sea, off their own land. Off, off their own land, yeah. Um, I think uh, Crown Estate and um, we'll have some information about, um, on, uh, you know, for them, uh, their aquaculture division there and also uh, Marine Scotland could could provide support as well. So so that's some good places to get, to get involved with um, initially as well. Brilliant. Okay, well, we've got a couple of moments. Um, just if anyone's got any questions uh, for Jonathan, who um, talked about... Um, agronomy um, for Patrick who uh, talked about crofts or for Jenny who's just been talking about um, aquaculture does anyone um, have anything else they want to raise either um, unclick yourself now and then ask directly or put it uh, in the chat well um there we go. If there's anything that comes up later, I'll forward it on and I do look, uh, I will get answers uh, for people. Um, that's been an absolutely fascinating tour around some um, ideas, loosely um, graph 
grouped around um, food production, though we covered de- various aspects of food production earlier on. Um, the modern apprenticeship scheme um, really becoming mature now, and that's a great insight that actually aquaculture is one of the industries um, that's adopted adopted it. Um, I've long thought that that's a really viable way for service people to get into a new career, um, because as you've hinted, um, you, know, you can do that at all levels. In fact, not in aquaculture by the looks of things, but in some areas right up to master's level, where if it's a new career, um, you can get grants to help you towards a, a, even a master's degree level apprenticeship. So it's something to think about um, for people who are retraining. Um, it's a very affordable way for both an employer um, and an individual to get um, an on-the-job education. Okay, well, I think we'll let uh, let people off the hook. There's uh, nothing appeared in the chat whilst I've been uh, doing what the TV presenters called filling there. Um, and uh, so we'll we'll let you off the hook. And thank you all three of you very much for uh, um, for the, all the work you've put into preparing and presenting and um, really fact-filled um, presentations. Um, we'll take a break now and come back at a quarter to four, 15.45, where Liz baron Majerick, the uh, lead of uh, director of Lan- Lantra Scotland, will talk about forestry. And we've got quite a team, um, ex-military team from Scottish Water, who are going to talk about a range of uh, opportunities again, which uh, probably most of us have never thought about um, across Scottish Water. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll take a break and see you at 16.45.
So um, welcome back everyone um, and welcome particularly um, to Dr. Liz uh, Baron uh, Majerick. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. I never know whether J's are silent or not. Majerick, a bit close. Majerick, sorry, <laughs> my apologies. Um, I've, uh, I've travelled when I was younger around um, Eastern Europe and learnt that wherever you go, your pronunciation is going to be wrong. And uh, so now I just weighed in. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, we're going to now go and look at land and facilities management, um, um, focusing particularly on forestry and then water management and uh, the areas around it. And uh, Dr. Um, Liz is a director of uh, Lantra in Scotland. Um, prior to joining Lantra uh, directly, she'd worked alongside the organisation whilst an academic at Inverness University. Uh, Liz holds a degree in botany and a PhD in agronomy. In 2011, she was awarded an MBE for her work engaging young people in um, STEM, setting up and running the Inverness Science Festival and the wonderfully named Steminars. Um, we're very, very uh, grateful, Liz, that you've agreed to join us this afternoon to focus particularly on forestry in Scotland. Thank you so much. If you just uh, turn up the microphone a bit um, and you are successfully sharing your screen, but we still can't hear you. Let's just see if I can help you with that. Uh, Is that okay? Is that better? Yeah, no, there you go. There we go. And, uh, if you put your slides onto presentation and then yep. I think we can go. Fantastic. Thank okay, you, great. So thank you uh, for giving me some time today to talk about forestry, the wood and the trees. Um, obviously, Lantra, uh, our logo, hints that we're heavily involved within the sector. But as Jenny's mentioned, each member of the team within Lantra in Scotland is responsible for a different sector and for working in that sector. And mine is forestry. So um, my name uh, is Liz Barami Yerick. Yes, I'm the director for Lantern Scotland, but I'm also the chair for the Forestry Skills Forum in England. Um, and I also sit both on the industry leadership group for forestry in Scotland um, and the skills group in Scotland. And I, we wouldn't need the skills group if we had enough people with the right skills. So a big hint there that uh, yes, we're, we're needing more people to go into forestry. Um, my email address or the email address for uh, any queries that you might have is up there on the this slide, but I'll also show that at the end as well. So why forestry? Well, this is, it's one of the sectors that's good for the environment, good for the economy, and good for everyone, really. Um, this first image on the slide is from CONFOR, and although it really focuses just on Wales, it gives some of the um, benefits of, in this case, a 20 hectare farm forest. So if we start off with carbon capture, um, trees are the most efficient mechanisms of carbon capture, um, no matter what any other announcements might be saying uh, in the last few days as well. And the added benefit of the carbon capture is that it also creates fantastic habitats for animals whilst it does it, um, and for many other species too. Um, it also provides an income in that as it's trapping the carbon, it's producing timber, and that carbon can be trapped longer term in buildings and in um, fibre, for example, as well. It's a great um, alternative for plastics to the cellulose that you can get from um, timber. Um, so it's, it's something that certainly we need to be producing a lot more of. Also can be used for recreation, mountain biking, hiking, etc. Shelter and on a farm as well for farm animals. Um, and of course, if we're producing timber here, we're not felling timber elsewhere in perhaps some more sensitive um, environments too. So it's always worth keeping that in mind. It's also worth thinking about the urban forest. And I know this is a rural presentation, but urban forests form an incredibly important part of green space in, in the urban environment. It's vital for well-being. It can help with crime reduction. Uh, it can help with cleaning the air, cooling the, the buildings. And of course, they can also have a positive impact on house prices. Um, just some of the social benefits are to be found online, but kids in particular thrive in forests. They've been shown to be particularly calming, for those with ADHD, those that have experienced trauma, and those that just want some peace. Um, I've often taken my kids out to the woods in the morning just to try and calm them down before they go to school. Um, there's something about the repetitive but yet stimulating view in the middle of a forest that's just particularly beneficial for well-beings. 
those are all some of the factors to think about for working in forestry. Um, it's worth acknowledging right at the start, though, that there are two tribes in forestry, the arbs and the forester. Um, the arboriculturalists, um, a lot of that work happens in the urban environment, mainly where trees impact on the individual on an individual tree basis. Um, so arboriculture is more about the tree as an individual. So some of the job titles in arboriculture could include tree surgeon, tree officer. So they might be surveying trees in towns and uh, cities. Um, they often work as well along ro roads and railway lines. So utility arboriculture, uh, as you can imagine, is uh, often very much in demand. In arboriculture, um, upper body strength um, is often very, very important. Not always, though it is mostly, um, in terms of climbing, because often you have to kind of lift your own weight. Yes, you're using all sorts of ropes as well, but it is important to be strong and fit. And of course, to have a good head for heights as well. It's very different from your more traditional forestry. So what is forestry? Well, that's trees plural, essentially. Um, if we start off with some of the different roles in forestry, at the top uh, there in the image, you can see a harvester, that's a forestry harvester machine, uh, two of them actually, um, working away there, harvesting trees mechanically. More and more, that is the norm. It's safer. Um, obviously, the person who's doing the harvesting is in the cab, um, but it's more effective in some environments than others. So there's still a place for the forestry craftsperson. So you can see somebody there doing some sledding um, on the trees uh, on the middle image. And of course, where you're felling trees, you also need to plant new trees, um, particularly within Scotland. Um, and particularly where felling, some of the felling operations have a restock requirement immediately afterwards within a set time. So there's, um, at the moment, as I'm sure you can imagine, we've got a 30,000 um, target for tree planting by 2025. Um, so we do need more tree planters. Um, currently in Scotland, I think something like 12,000 of those are planted in Scotland. Um, so Scotland's obviously ahead of the curve, 15,000 14,000, I think, planted last year. Um, I'll need to get the most up-to-date figures. And about 11,000 of those were planted in Scotland. So Scotland's obviously far ahead, but there's still a lot to do. Um, of course, where you're planting trees, you also need to have tree nurseries. Uh, two of the main ones in Scotland would be Alba and Christie's Elite. And that's an ideal role if you're kind of torn between horticulture and um, forestry as well. Then of course you've got the other type, of forest nursery, which is more linked with forest schools and outdoor education. Um, that is certainly a growing area. Uh, New Battle Abbey College is just one of the places it runs training in that area. Um, and there are some fantastic examples of sites that take uh, groups from different mainstream schools as well. Um, Abriakin uh, up north is a, is a great example of that. Um, and that certainly can be very rewarding to be involved within the forestry and education side. Um, when trees are felled, they're obviously taken, and I've missed an image out here, um, to the mills. So firstly, logistics, the forestry sector, like many others, are always looking for drivers um, and people who can help to transport um, the, for the timber from one site to the mills. Uh, logistics is a big part of forestry. There is the um, Forestry Transport Forum set up just to support that um, and of course then managing it when it gets to site two. In the mills themselves, which are doing very well at the moment, they're always keen to take on particularly engineers, uh, also apprentices, um, but if you've just generally got a good head for logistics then I'm sure that you'd be of interest to them too. If you know where you're going, <laughs> sometimes it's worth visiting the sites and most of them do tours as well, sometimes you'd be going in with a group of others. Um, there's a, a fantastic um, board manufacturing site as well uh, between Inverness and Nern, which does um, fantastic tours and just shows you how everything all fits together. Um, and they're big recruiters up there in our board. Um, of course, that timber then can go into sustainable construction. And although that's kind of verging on the, the edge of forestry, if you like, um, it's important to know what sustainable construction is looking for in terms of the properties of the timber. And the properties of the timber depends upon species, genetics and location as well. So there's a lot of research and investment happening in those areas um, and there are a number of government initiatives um, around that as well. So that's also an interesting area to be involved in. 
Um, of course, the spare bits um, and the biomass side, again, uh, with more regulations around air quality and more people wanting to have stoves or alternative forms of heating in their house, that's also an interesting area to get involved in. Um, and this last image that I have is about satellite imagery. This is now used a lot in forestry, um, whether it's to track disease, um, number of diseases spreading into Britain at the moment, um, which are of uh, sudden uh, oak death, um, Phytophthora, um, and the use of satellite imagery can help to track where that is. Um, it's also in terms of growth, production, climate change, so if you're familiar with the, the use of satellite data, that's also a bonus. So these are just some of the job roles or titles that are associated with forestry, and um, there's certainly quite a big range, and I think there's something to suit everyone within forestry. Um, I could say that, it's one of the sectors that I look after. Um, sometimes though, because of this, you need a few different terms in your job searching. So you can't just search for forestry, um, you also need to search for trees, woodland, timber, agriculture, green space, there's lots of different um, terms that you might want to use depending upon exactly what you want to do. I've often found that as well that forest and forestry are terms that you have to use for some search engines depending on how advanced they are. But that's just an example of some of the different roles. They can also be clustered into different areas. So you've got agroforestry and mountain forestry kind of more overlapping with um, agriculture. You've got social and urban development. So a lot of that around um, urban forestry, green space. So some of the cities now are having to face certain green space targets. And it's where would you put the trees then that they're going to be healthy for the longest term and you're going to get the best return for your investment, really. Um, forest manage management themselves. So when you plant your trees, you still have to look after them. Um, they don't just look after themselves. So it might be for thinning. It might be monitoring for pests and diseases. Um, you've got your forest inventory, so you know when um, it's the right time to harvest as well and what you might get out of that um, area in terms of investment. And there's quite a lot around risk management as well. Um, then, of course, you've got the biodiversity and ecosystem functioning area um, and some of that around, you know, the nature protection, biodiversity as well, forest water. So, of course, your land management, that affects your water um, and you're going to be hearing more in that area after itself. You've also got the health and recreation benefits, so ecotherapy, like I mentioned before, um, and then you've got the education and research aspects as well. The vast majority of that is done by forest research. Um, although there are other universities involved in that too. And then you've got the wood and the energy production from that too. So it's a huge, huge sector. It's pretty much everything you can think of, but with trees. Um, apologies for the colours in the slide. I can actually feel Jenny flinching as I show it. It's just, it's an old one. I've never got around to updating, but it does talk about some of the different routes. So these are the SEQF levels down the side from four to 12, 12 being PhD, or being kind of entry level uh, intermediate one or equivalent to, to old standard grade general. So um, there's the engineering route to come into forestry because of course a lot of forestry does involve engineering as well. Um, you can go in through um, different routes um, through the kind of traditional school routes, but also um, the forestry routes, the PDA in forestry is a good entry point. That one's completely distance learning and you can do that from um, anywhere. It's a um, Scottish qualification delivered by Scottish School of Forestry up in Inverness. Um, and there are degree options that can be done distance learning, which you can pick and mix modules from as well. Um, and then, of course, if you've got any of the engineering qualifications, those are um, sought after in terms of um, particularly the mills, but also the harvesting side, if you're happy to, to deal with machinery. Some of the education providers in this area. So I mentioned the Scottish School of Forestry up in Inverness. There's also SRUC Barony campus based down um, in the Fries of Galloway. The University of Aberdeen mainly now just does master's programmes. Um, and then, but there's also Rural Skills Scotland, which I haven't put a location on because they um, do more work-based learning. But if you're signed up for an apprenticeship, it might be um, that organisation that might support you. If you're going through the learning and just as what Jenny mentioned before as well there are there's no normal age for an apprenticeship within the land-based sector and people come in from all backgrounds um, from all ranges of experience um, into these sectors and forestry in particular is is recruiting a lot in that area as I'll mention again a little bit later there's uh, links to these organizations on the slide you can also do short courses short courses are incredibly important within forestry 
Um, I've put Lantra up at City and Guilds as well, uh, not being biased here. Um, and also the Forestry Industry Safety Accord or FISA, they also do training, particularly around the chainsaw side of things. Um, but you can find a huge range of different courses um, on the Lantra Awards website in particular, um, particularly rated to chainsaw and arboriculture. Um, I mentioned the apprenticeships, so uh, Forestry Land Scotland, they're advertising just now as well. There's other ones being advertised, it's a nursery operative one, and um, it's being advertised down in England. You'll notice a lot go through the government website, um, other places that you can find jobs, um, within forestry particularly though would be in the Institute of Chartered Foresters pages um, that's their professional body um, but they do often um, advertise jobs if you follow them on social media as well. Um, there's the Arboriculture Association if that's more your area of interest I highly recommend um, browsing their website there's a lot of resources on there too and there's also the Royal Forestry Society um, which has a number of um, education resources as well and publications on their site which has more information. Um, if it's particularly the machinery side of things do follow, follow the Forestry Machinery Journal on social media. Um, they, they have a lot of opportunities um, that they share within their sites as well. And it just talk a lot about machines of all sorts of different colours too. Um, so that was a very quick tour to forestry, um, just in case any of you have any questions. Um, and as I've put up there as well, that's my, the email address if you've got any queries too. Um, thanks very much. <laughs> Amazing to um, around there. Um, there's a question um, from um, Tim Mann, which we might just cover off now about uh, more senior um, roles for um, management. Um, unqualified in the sector, um, but uh, but older. Um, he in particular is an RF engineer with lots of uh, safety and quality um, experience. And behind him, have you got anything um, that you'd like to address in that sector or more broadly, Liz? Um, yes, so it depends, as it often depends on the sites and the type of work that's being done. Um, the One of the things I would definitely recommend is getting in touch with FISA. So for all forestry, health and safety, FISA is the website that you would go to for more information within that area. Um, so there's that aspect and they're always looking for other trainers too, which is a, a useful um Kind of weigh in if you like even if it's not specifically to do with forestry um, there are um, a number of um, kind of modules or units as well that you could do particularly through the forestry school in Inverness which are entirely distance learning which will help to give you some of the background to it um, so it's worth getting in touch with them um, it would be unstructured study is the term that you would use if you were contacting them it wouldn't be particularly for the aim for having a degree at the end of it, it would just be for picking specific modules that would be of interest to you. Um, that's probably the main ways that I would uh, do that approach that area. Um, yeah, and speaking to FISA. Um, does that that cover it? Off to the thanks for, from Tim there. Unless you um, wanted to say anything further. Okay, thank thanks very much. I think he's. Uh, I think he's going to stay in the background there. Um, thank you um, very much. Uh, I would just make a comment about chainsaw qualifications um, th from um, what I've seen. There are an awful lot of places to get chainsaw qualifications. Um, they can be more expensive than they look because of the cost of hiring PPE. Some trainers provide it, some don't. Um, but what you'll find is where your SLC, Standard Learning Credit, will just about cover um, entry level um, course costs. Um, a lot of regimental or um, Air Force and, and the RAF um, Association um, will provide grants to top that up or where you're doing um, two courses into the one week package, um, which can come up to sort of £800 sort of level. Um, they'll often um, add in a grant to, to help that. So if cost is an issue with doing these courses it is worth being a bit imaginative um, and service funds um, I found are actually um, quite willing to, to back these things up if you've got a concrete plan. It is also worth just making sure that you're doing the right course for what you need to do because there mm -hmm. are so many different chainsaw courses. Mm. Absolutely make sure they're accredited and that they're accredited for the right diameter of tree and, and the kind of operations you might be doing and I, I would personally always recommend a course where the training is separate from the assessment 
so that you have time to embed your skills before you then go for the assessment. Because if you don't pass that, then you have to pay to do the assessment again. Mm. I don't know how that works out with your own funding. It might be that um, that, that would be a challenge. Um, and I know that FISA are putting quite a lot of work now into a kind of professional levelling for chainsaw work so that there is there is that time and that expectation that there will be more consolidation because, you know, it, it takes a while to bed in those skills. OK, well, that's really useful. Thank you. Um, OK, well, let's um, let's move on. Thank you very much indeed, Liz. Really appreciate your time. That's really no kind. Problem. Thank you for the invitation. Um, we're going to move on um, to the team from Scottish Water. Um, Scottish Water is responsible for a, a wide range of um, water services and related land management uh, roles across the country. And uh, they're also uh, a very forces friendly employer who this year were awarded the Armed Forces Covenant Gold Award um, only three years after originally signing the covenant, which is a pretty amazing achievement. Um, it's testament to the strength of the Armed Forces community within the company and evidence of a really, truly forces friendly employer. And we're joined by some of the team who led the campaign um, and I think other ex-forces staff who together are going to give us a feel for the wide range of roles available across the company and their culture. And um, we've got Jared um, and Sophie that I know of. Um, and perhaps I'll let you uh, tell us who's in the team and uh, and to take it away. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Fiona. Um, hi, my name's Sophie Mackay. Um, I uh, spent 10 years um, in the reserves um, and retired three years ago. Um, but throughout my civilian career, I've been involved in the defense industry, the nuclear industry, and now the water industry. So a bit of an eclectic um, mix there. And I've been with Scottish Water for the last four years. Um, and as Fiona has alluded to, um, we have um, quite a passionate um, armed forces network within Scottish Water. Um, and amongst uh, the group of us, we've been driving forward various changes internally um, with a new armed forces policy this year um, and other great work that we're doing in and about our local communities, um, as well as internally in the company, which has um, kind of got us that, that gold award recognition, which is really great to see. Um, so, but today I'm very much kind of handing over to my colleagues. So we've got um, John Stoddart, who's here, who's ex-forces himself. Um, and lives over in Skye, lucky guy. Um, I wish I was there myself. Um, and we've also got Jared Stewart on as well, although um, he's not ex-forces, he very much has a rural background himself um, and comes from um, farming as well. So they're both going to talk through their kind of roots into the roles that they're currently doing in Scottish Water. Uh, um, and John's obviously going to touch on um, his experience in transitioning um, from the military um, as well and obviously if there's any questions or points that people want to raise by all means pop it in the chat box um, or we, we can cover any kind of questions at the end um, so over to you guys do you want me to go first John or yourself uh, I'm not not first yeah you go first and I'll go first <laughs> Okay, I'll go first. Okay, so as um, Sophie mentioned there, I, d I don't come from a, a military background. I come from very much still a rural uh, and farming background, albeit I think sometimes my father did raise me like I was in the military half the time. But that's I think there's a lot of parallels there of getting up early and doing a lot of things until you collapse in your bed. So with this, I'm not going to go over ground that's already been covered by other participants today but they've talked specifically about land management and various aspects of agriculture forestry and everything else that's effectively what we do in the bigger picture so the technical details there's no point in us going through it so what i'm going to do is i've got a two very short presentations well one's longer but i'll go through it a lot quicker um so one of them is um the route that i took to get to where i was basically so i'm just going to if I just uh, share my screen, I'm just hoping my internet holds up. That's the joy of living in the country, is you have bad internet. <sighs> Excuse me. Okay, excellent. I just got the thumbs up there from Fiona. Perfect. Right, okay, so very snappily 
perspective from from standing out in my field on wet plus three days is, to standing in my field. This is, is actually the home farm. We're up in uh, the uplands of, of uh, Perthshire there. I'm afraid um, it's and bad news. You can see you've got a little bit of sheep down the bottom there just doing their own thing. So just to run, yes. We, 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 you're, I think you are having yeah. trouble with your signal. We, we can barely understand you when you've got the slides up. Internet's not good. Yeah, I think you're going to have to, uh, to, to, to talk us through it without the slides, I'm afraid. They, perhaps if you send them to me, I can share them uh, later. Jared, if you fire them quickly across via email to myself right. and I can share them on screen. We've got pretty good internet there we go. today okay. in Inverness. Uh, do you have the copy I sent you before? Sophie? Yeah, is it exactly the same? It's just just that one, yes, and the other one I'll I'll try and squeeze through. What it is is my my would son's. You, would you it. like us to to let John perhaps? Do you want yeah, to let, go first yeah. and while you and Sophie sort that out offline? Would that be all right with you, John? It's perfect. Well, you leap in then, John, and 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 we'll we'll come back to Jared. <laughs> oh, the communications problems everywhere, just as well as some ex-forces here. Hey, can you hear me okay? E excellent. Hi, I'm John Stoddart. I'm currently part of the sustainable land management team within Scottish Water. I, I work for Jared. Um, as Sophie said earlier on, I'm ex-forces. I, I actually have done 10 years in the regulars and about seven or eight in the reserves while it's working with Scottish Water. Um, which is very supportive and still is. Sophie's done a lot of work on that. Um, I've got a croft on Sky. It's been in the in, in the family for generations, and it's probably one of the main reasons I am where I am because I can actually speak to farmers as part of our job. Uh, you go, go out and you know one end of the cow from the other, so it gives you the ability to have that common conversation with them. Um, it helps us in trying to protect the raw water quality and um, do aspects of land management with them. Um, it's been very helpful in the current role. Um, going back further after I left the army, I started with Scottish Water. And I can definitely say that my experiences, training, etc., within the forces actually made me far more employable in Scottish Water than some other people. Your positive attitude, your willingness to learn, your ability to do coaching and, and uh, pass on training and information to others really held me in good stead. I started off at the bottom of the ladder as well, and now I'm in a team with half of them have degrees and PhDs, and some of just got here by ability and willingness to learn and, you know, some luck. And it's been a it's been a good road so far. Uh, that, that's that's about me. I'm not sure if Jared can come back in yet. So, so perhaps what what's really useful is just to explain how you found um, this this career because it's not something that's very visible, perhaps to to people leaving the forces. <laughs> well, it's actually going back to there was a gentleman on that was mentioning transferable skills. And it's something you don't actually think that, that you actually have until you go for the interview and you actually realize that compared to other people, you, you're, you've, you've got first aid, you've got health and safety, you, you, your ability to read a map, your ability to communicate along different lines. I mean, even within Scottish water forestry and, and a lot of the outdoor ones that have been on here, they use things like VHF radios and lots of other communications equipment. You're actually one step ahead of a lot of people. One, one of the most important important things from my forces background I think that helped me was your ability to actually coach people because once you move on in the army you're actually trained how to do presentations you're trained how to do training you're trained how to do coaching when you get in the wider world these these skills aren't really allowed uh, aren't really around so for you to go into a company like Scottish Water these sort of things are really important and they're really sought after you know, you can go in and you can do a presentation or you can go out and do coaching for manual handling and health and safety and stuff like that. And that is really what's, you know, pushed me forward through a lot of things. You know, just the actual training and the ability to pass it on. 
So that's that's probably been the most important aspect of mine. No, that's a really interesting point about the the coaching. Thank you. Okay, let's see if your uh, your boss you said did you? Let's see if he's, uh, it, he's yes. ready. There we go. Right, underpaid. Uh, thanks for that, John. Uh, thanks for calling me your boss as well. That's the first time in five years. Right. Okay. So um, going back to the beginning, so I'm um, I'm not from a armed forces background. Uh, I am from very much a rural background. So the route that I've taken to get to where I am now is probably slightly more conventional. That, um, but I did start born and raised on a, a sheep and cattle farm in, in the uplands of Perthshire. So definitely get my hands dirty from an early age. Um, but you know, I, I, my mother was very surprised I managed to get enough hires to get into university, which was fine. So I, I went on to gain a, a degree in an honours degree in agriculture from Edinburgh University. It was some of the best times of my life down there. It was, it was very much learning about all about the science and the practicalities of agriculture to a degree level, but also having a lot of fun too. And then I graduated from Aberdeen University with an honours degree in forestry management. Now, the reason I did that was because the first two years of both agriculture and forestry management are practically identical. It's the science-based part of your degree, and there's very little difference between the sciences between agriculture and forestry, other than agriculture takes on animal physiology rather than just sticking with plant physiology. So it was only another two years to do that. I will put my hand up and say there was also uh, a woman involved too, so um, that did also lead me to go and do that second degree. Um, and as it says, land and land management has always been my passion and continues to be my passion. Uh, and I'd never thought I'd actually be leading a team of land managers like John and the rest of the crew in Scottish Water. That was the one that took me by surprise. So, so if we go on to the next slide. Um, so just quickly, the, the route, my work route that I took. So it was uh, one and a half year service with Scottish Natural Heritage. There I learned about um, the conservation of countryside, which I knew at a very early age was quite kind of intrinsic to the whole working of land management in Scotland, or at least the UK. And then several years experience as an agricultural officer in the Outer Hebrides, there I learned to not only surf on my lunch break, but gained a lot of experience in a regulatory role. I say that is because we're governed by a lot of regulations. There's general binding rules, there's um, um, powerful acts that we also operate under as well, uh, and they all have an influence on um, how we manage land. Then I managed to get a promotion uh, to do more back office stuff in HQ, and that's when I led into um, doing team leading, um, which was quite interesting, and that's where I cut my teeth. Um, and then I learned about policy management, um, and that was about developing and delivering policy. And that is a much bigger picture um, style of work to do. Um, you're talking about trying to implement ideas, people's ideas, into something practical, which takes an awful lot more work. And then I joined the Forestry Commission because I had this degree in forestry management. I got a secondment as a woodland officer, and that taught me about the regulations surrounding um, woodland management and about the practicalities of modern forestry management, which is a lot different than it used to be. And then um, quite recently, five years in counting with Scottish Water, um, as a team leader and then moved up as the, the technical lead on top of that. And that's where I, I get to work with um, people like John and the rest of the team, which is which is really, really good and really interesting. And, and it's great to work with dedicated people. So the kind of key messages, sorry, John. I just said lucky us. <laughs> Thanks, that'll be in your appraisal. Um, so just the key messages out of that is, um, there's not a single route to your desired position. There's many different ways to go about it. Um, and But it all leads to the right place if that's what you want to do. Uh, and sometimes you have to move sideways to gain that experience before you can move forward. So never, never doubt moving sideways, you're on the same pay band, you're on the same grade, whatever. You have to, sometimes you have to go sideways before you can go forward. And sometimes getting your hands to understanding of what you're trying to do, you can then communicate what you want to achieve to other land managers. And having a good academic background is always an advantage, but it's not always essential. Just having good practical experience, skills you've learned elsewhere, just sometimes lends themselves to that particular role. 
And once you're inside an organization, take advantage of every opportunity, including to move, moving to other roles within that organization, even if it moves you away from the things you want to do and any training that comes your way, that's really crucial. And sometimes it's the organization you least suspect or don't think about that's doing some of the most rewarding work. So that, that brings me on to being in Scottish Water. I never in my dreams thought Scottish Water was doing anything <clears throat> remotely land management. And there I am now, technical lead of the sustainable land management team. So that's me just now, Sophie. I did send another presentation, but I think the internet's taken a, a bit of a dive. It was really just to explain what we do within Scottish Water as a team, um, but I'm happy for those slides to be shared. Any questions? If I could no, just no, ask yeah. you, please, between you, if you could just give us a feel for how the um, military um, network works within the company and why that's important. Um, yeah, if you consider it from the perspective of someone who's joining, and what you do to support them as they come in and then later in their career. I think that would be really interesting for us. Yeah, I'm more than happy to cover that. So um, we have um, the Armed Forces Network actually sits as um, a network of a, a collection of networks that we have. So they're actually called um, Belong Groups um, within Scottish Water. Um, and I, we do have quite a large company. We're looking at Circa. 5,000 um, employees um, and one of the things that had come out of surveys of the a number of the employees was, was that I, th I think it's fair to say lack of sense of belonging um, which is something that obviously you know has been on quite a few military adverts recently it's something that the military very much um, does exceedingly well um, and also with the obviously changing focus I think it's fair to say um, from a cultural aspect over the last few years in terms of diversity and inclusion so we actually have um, nine diversity and inclusion groups the armed forces network is just one of them and um, we also have a women in Scottish water network we have a multicultural network and um, we have a next gen um, kind of the next generation um, and equally we have a generation plus um, network so there's there are lots of different networks within the company um, and certainly from a personal experience it has really helped me because although I had been in the reserves and um, the military had been a large part of my life um, essentially from the age of 14 right the way through um, until very recently I won't quite give my age away um, but um, it had been a large part. It is also one of the things in the military is it, it, it is quite clear cut in terms of the expectations that are required of you as an individual prior to promotion or, or a certain career or a certain area within the military. It is quite clear in terms of, you know, you, you have to have gone on certain courses, you have to have a X number of recommended reports. Um, that doesn't come in civilian life. So um, you can find it sometimes quite demoralizing and, and certainly when I came into the company it was a bit of what game are we playing here who do I need to speak to it's a big wide company knowing the right people to speak to um, at the right time so again it is about building your networks and um, I've touched on it with people before LinkedIn is a massive asset that's how Fiona and I I think um, originally collaborated and it has since turned out that one of our individuals on the armed forces network you actually used to be their commanding officer so uh, <laughs> the small world that is the military and um, very much carries over and um, from military but also into civilian life and so one of the things that we're focusing on um, in our armed forces network is not only trying to improve um, I, I suppose the intercompany relationships and networks, but also promoting military and in individuals within the company, be that um, in terms of um, promoting the, the shared learning and shared skill set um, and those transferable skills that military individuals have, um, or be that externally as well and um, supporting. So again, if anybody's interested um, in kind of a career in the very north of Scotland, in the Highlands, there is um, a Highland Armed Forces Events Committee, which is doing a similar thing. Um, Scottish Water Armed Forces Network are involved in that, um, but very much promoting careers um, and events in the Highlands. And again, we, we've obviously um, joined forces there with Rural Link as well. Um, so very similar to what you're 
um, kind of doing for Yona. So there is a lot of support there. It's very much effectively a buddy buddy system, um, but an informal approach to that. Um, and the support, as I say, extends um, as much as our colleagues are essentially wanting it to extend because it is very much um, driven by X forces um, and, and current serving reservists. You know, so it is areas um, that are passionate to ourselves, but what you then find is there is that passion and drive um, behind it. Um, and as I say, we, we took on the challenge of changing um, a corporate policy this year, which um, as John and Jared will probably um, support, that's no mean feat um, within um, an organization such as Scottish Water, which obviously thro flows through um, with the Scottish government, but we did change that policy and got a standalone armed forces policy, um, which very much, again, supports not only the individuals, but also the individual's line manager as well, so that they can help, it can help them understand um, what support they can and need to offer to individuals um, who are either ex-serving or currently serving. So hopefully that's a, a little bit of a, a flavor um, has anyone got, I don't know if anyone's got any particular... There's a, there's a conversation going on in the chat, which would be worth bringing right. out as well. So you start off with main bases, and uh, Jared's replied that the main bases are Inverness, Aberdeen, Dundee, Dunfermline, and Edinburgh. But I know, um, and that's starting to come out in the chat, that you, you've you always worked agile because of the number of people you've got across the Highlands and Islands and, and more broadly. Um, so perhaps um, being able to explain just a little bit of the structure um, in terms of work, but also um, how you work so that, um, because I know Scottish Water is very accessible to people uh, who maybe don't uh, commute into the main uh, the main centres. Yeah, so I think there is very much a split at the moment and it is certainly changing. So one of the areas of the business that I'm involved in at the moment um, is business transformation. We are um, transforming the company as it currently stands. Um, as it currently stands, there are a number of um, localized roles. So that's very much um, operational based. Um, that's where you see the Scottish water vans um, quite often trundling about, but actually the majority of our workforce um, are in office-based roles, um, supporting um, operations um, and other roles such as John and Jared's. And as they've kind of alluded to in the chat, um, that works in a, in a flexible sense. So I, live in Inverness. I've always worked in from Inverness and um, working for Scottish Water. Um, but the, the team that I actually manage are majority based in the central belt of Scotland. So Edinburgh, Glasgow, um, that does present a challenge in itself. Um, but very much um, COVID <laughs> has put everybody in the same situation. And it is something that um, as an employer, Scottish Water very much support and certainly going forward with the transformation that we're doing will very much continue to support um, because it will lead us um, to our overall um, kind of strategic objectives of becoming um, net zero by 2040. So we have very much a challenge on our hands, but the, the flexible and ag agile working will very much support that. Um, and I have um, friends and uh, family over in the Western Isles of Scotland, and sometimes I'll work um, from from the house over there or equally and um, work from the office over there and again um, as long as my delivery outputs don't drop um, then obviously my my immediate line manager doesn't have any issue um, with where I'm working from and COVID um, in terms of the opportunities that come out and um, that is very much an opportunity that has has presented itself with COVID and has where we had probably areas that were not as keen to support agile working and flexible working. And um, those areas of the business have now very much seen um, that there are a number of roles throughout the company that can effectively be done um, from anywhere, which is great to see. Can I just add to Sophie as well, when I when I started in Scottish Water, I started off in a sky-based role. Um, I'm, st I'm still in the same office 23, 24 years later, and I have changed roles several times. I went from being sky based to being highland based and now I cover the whole of Scotland. So the flexibility is there within Scottish water, probably more so than in a lot of companies. So it's, it's not something, you know, that's that's every company can offer you. So it's quite good. We've got we've got half a dozen ex forces in, in the team on sky itself. Um, well, about half a dozen submariners count. I'm not quite sure. 
But <laughs> yeah, there are. When I started in the Scottish Water in Sky, there was no X forces, and, and now I think we're about half a dozen on Sky itself. So it is a growing area, and, and for a reason, because it's got these skill sets that we're looking for. Brilliant. No, thanks. Thanks very much. That's um, that's a lot of personal. Uh personal uh, stories just to, to give us a, a feel. We've still got uh, Liz from Lantra hanging um, and around um, in the background. I'm very grateful. Um, does anyone have any um, questions um, or points to make? Or in fact, Liz, have you got any comments to make that have occurred to you or that uh, that come up now to, to add before we, uh, we close off um, this session? Um, yeah, just I think also it's worth just noting that there is a conversion course. If you've already got first aid, um, there is a plus F that you need if you're working within forestry, which is, I think, a good day conversion course. Um, so it's worth considering that as well, because, you know, if somebody's recruiting for tree planters or, um, you know, if it's a contractor that's recruiting, mm. that's often something they're going to ask for. Yeah. Has there been any work done between Lancher and the MOD to look at uh, skills conversion and um, skills mapping at all, do you know? Um, not from Lantra. Um, I know that some of the training providers, so the colleges or universities, some of them have looked at that in specific cases, but I think it can vary quite a lot depending on what the course is. Mm. Um, so first aid is probably the easiest one to look at, but most training providers will have some experience or you can speak to them mm. um, to see how some things might map across. Or if you're stuck at all, just get in touch with us. And if we don't know, we'll find somebody who does. There's that famous promise. We'll find out. Thank you so much. Um, well, um, folks, it's been uh, been fantastic. And I, I mean, unless anyone's got any final points, um, we'll close the land and facilities management uh, section there. And I've just got a few wrap up points, um, which are about next steps, uh, specifically aimed at um, the resettlers on the call. Um, just one so, from myself here. Yeah, if there please. is anybody that's interested or gets any kind of further questions or queries, um, please do reach out um, either through yourself, um, we can kind of connect or through LinkedIn. Um, certainly yeah. the Armed Forces Network within Scottish Water are more than more than happy to help, even if it's a non-Scottish Water related inquiry. So, Well, perhaps perhaps if you've got a, an email, whether you've got a team one or something, you could just put it in the chat now. Absolutely. Uh, for yeah. those who are interested. And I'll capture the chat before I close out to republish any of those points of contact as well. Um, so, um, so thanks to the team. Uh, if you if you want to uh, cloak yourselves again, that's fine. Or well, you're very welcome to keep smiling at me, whichever whichever suits you. But as uh, Liz has pointed out, now that all the children are not doing their homework, but uh, playing on their um, whatever devices they're playing on, the internet is even more challenged than it was. Um, if you are interested um, in any of these um, careers um, and you're um, looking um, to, to move forward and get some experience and indeed some qualifications. Here's a few um, points of reference and, and thoughts um, for you. Um, I'm gonna talk briefly about civilian work attachments that we um, have heard mentioned um, by a number of speakers and also the value of volunteering, which we've also heard. Um, I'll talk a little bit about courses and qualifications. And finally, after not more than uh, eight to 10 minutes, um, I will, uh, I will close us down. It looks like we'll be slightly ahead of time. Um, so firstly, um, civilian work attachments. And uh, for most of the day, we've been joined by um, Freely Scott Park, um, who um, is a, a farmer. Um, she, her husband and her son um, have recently hosted an intern of mine um, who came to, to spend a, a couple of days with on their farm, um, and we we had we we're all lined up to offer um, civilian work attachments um, there in a structured way. And of course, this year that's been extremely challenging. Uh, Frida is going to uh, uncloak herself in a minute um, and just give us a couple of uh, minutes just to explain why um, she was keen to do that. I think, um, and also um, what she hopes to get out of that. Um, Rupert Shaw, who spoke a couple of um, earlier on in the day, has done something similar. And um, for those of you who are uh, magazine collectors, you may have seen an article in NFU Scotland's publication, Leader, um, back in June, um, which talks about Rural Link and also featured Rupert. And he talked about, as a business owner, why hosting civilian work attachments was so useful. Frida saw that article 
and got in touch. And uh, Frida, you've got a couple of minutes just to explain why that was interesting to you and, uh, and what, what, you're, what you're looking for for someone who might come and spend a couple of weeks on the farm with you and what you can do for them. Hi, everybody. It's been a really useful um, day for me to hear quite a lot of uh, um, opportunities for people to move from, you know, the joint forces um, into what I suppose a lot of you do, what a lot of us guys call real life. Um, we've, we're at um, Port Nelland Farm. We're on the south end of Loch Lomond, just about 25 miles north of Glasgow city centre. Uh, we're an organic farm where the health and the welfare of the animals and the soil is of paramount importance to us. Uh, we are a commercial farm, but I would maintain that um, we're a very small farm and um, because we farm organically, we're not going to be able to feed the world, but we do feel we're doing the right thing by the animals and the environment. Um, the farm's been in the family uh, since 1952. My husband, David, um, his father uh, farmed it first from the 50s onwards. David joined the farm in the middle of the 80s. And now my son, Chris, has joined us. So there's the three partners on the farm. I'm just the incomer, really. Um, <laughs> the farmer's wife, so to speak. I have a perfectly uh, normal career as a veterinary surgeon, but not a conventional veterinary surgeon. I have a portfolio career as a vet. Uh, we were a dairy farm, um, but our 230 acres is too small really to expand and survive in the current climate. And so in 2010, we commenced the uh, transition to beef um, and we bred all our own animals uh, to being beef animals from dairy cows. And they're all fed off the grass or silage um, from our own farm. We don't feed any extra cake or anything else like that. We're very proud of our grass fed organic beef. Um, we've hosted volunteers for over 30 years on the farm. Initially, um, a lot of vet students wanted to come and work with us when we were a dairy because that's how they get their um, extramural uh, experience. And uh, for the last uh, 10 years, we've been taking woofers and that stands for Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms. So these are um, people of all ages, really. Majority of them will be in their 20s looking for experience um, on organic farms. And a lot of them express a real interest in um, the principles of organic farming. We're an unusual farm in that we're quite highly diversified. Um, we're in a very beautiful location. We have a mile of Loch Lomond. And so the first bit of diversification was um, into moorings, boat moorings. And then we renovated the old farmhouse, which is where the dairyman used to live, into four-star self-catering. We also have a glamping tent, which is um, active from April to the end of October. And we also offer water sports in the um, form of kayaks and paddle boards. And my son runs speedboat trips from the farm. We also do farm tours and we're part of a very active agritourism group. There'll be about 120 agritourism businesses who are together on uh, WhatsApp or um, conferences weekly. Um, so we're very comfortable having volunteers. We're a very friendly, welcoming family. Um, we'd love to show people just what is possible on different areas of farming. Rupert um, described it perfectly, how um, a little piece of land can actually really make quite a difference, um, you know, to how you farm it and how you actually make money and make a business out of it. So if anyone has any interest in coming to see some practice with us, see what we're doing, and if we can help you to a further career in farming, we'd be very happy to do that. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you very much, Frida. And if anybody is interested in pursuing that, um, then I'm very happy to put you in touch and to talk to you about um, how that works. Um, you may also have seen um, a Farmer's Guardian last week where they published a call to arms, double page spread, exactly on... Um, what the benefits to um, farms are in volunteering um, to uh, support service leavers in this way. And it comes down to the skills and the attitude we've been talking about all day. Um, farmers um, uh, won't say no um, to skilled, motivated people 
um, turning up when someone else is paying um, is the bottom line. Um, but then actually what they really enjoy doing is then teaching and passing on their skills. Um, so it really is a win-win for everyone. And, um, and, and I, I'm um, really focused on this um, as a way of putting people in touch with farming, but other businesses as well, um, to give people the experience uh, that they need um, to then um, pick up work um, and their gateway job um, straight from that. So if you're interested in that, um, there's some opportunities on the website. There are plenty more that I haven't got around to publishing yet, and I will. Um, and uh, But just get in touch and I'll see if I can find something for you. Um, by the same token, volunteering. Now, civilian work attachments you can only do when you're in your formal resettlement period and your terminal leave um, period. And of course, when you're in a position where you can get the time away from work, and that's very chain of command dependent. Um, volunteering, however, is something you can do um, a lot earlier in your career, and it's a good way of sticking your toe into the water and finding out if it really is something, um, your sector is something you want to do. Um, in environmental conservation, um, working with wildlife trusts, whatever your local county or regional wildlife trust is, that's quite a good way to, to get involved. Um, if you want to find out what some of the benefits of that is, um, there's a standalone um, eight minute video on um, on Royal Link website and it's also on the Royal Link YouTube channel. Watch that. Um, Andy Lee, who's uh, in the process of leaving the Royal Air Force, recorded that for me to explain how he's used his voluntary roles in job applications and um, how they've enhanced his CV and got him got him into um, through the door. Um, and so that's uh, that's really quite a powerful eight minute watch. Um, we're working to um, create military only um, volunteer activities uh, specifically as well. Um, so, for instance, Op Kingfisher, which we develop on the Salisbury Plain, doesn't suit the Scottish uh, market, but we will get others. In the north of England, around Hull, the Green Task Force is doing a tree based um, scheme, um, which is uh, about um, developing skills, but with um, an employment opportunity. Um, on the back of it. Um, and as I say, there are wildlife trusts. Um, in terms of courses and qualifications, you've heard mention of the High Ground Rural Week. That's really um, a great place to start. Um, most people on the call may have come beyond that, uh, that phase, but in terms of career seekers, just knowing what's available, um, I hope we've given you a really good insight and some more start points today. Um, high ground when we get out of the COVID nightmare is a good place to spend a bit longer, um, a whole week and um, getting some hands-on experience. So I commend that charity um, to you. Um, you can use your um, SLCs for short courses, but of course you only get a small amount of money a year. Um, so you need to, to use that wisely. Um, and those of course are best used for skills-based courses. Um, ELCs are difficult to use, um, but um, my strong advice is don't be in a rush to spend them. You've got five years after you leave to use ELCs, and they're actually an asset. Um, you are very likely to go into the wrong job um, straight after you leave the forces and only find the right job two or three moves down the line. Um, and that will still give you time to go to an employer and say, yeah, I don't have that qualification you want, but I've got all of this. And by the way, I come with £2,000 a year, um, which if you're willing to give me the time, um, the MOD will provide some of the, um, the money to fund that particular training, obviously at level four and above. Um, and the Lantra um, instructor role, which uh, Jenny mentioned, um, is a really um, valuable thing to put in your back pocket. Lantra website um, very clearly lays out what should, if all goes according to, to plan, be a 10-week process. So if you've got an outdoor skill, you've clearly got the ability to instruct in uh, you know the vast majority of cases from your military career. Consider getting yourself qualified whilst you're still serving as an outdoor skills instructor, because that will give you a, an income on a on a, um, a you know a part time basis, um, but also by doing those courses in partnership with um, a centre which will employ you um, on a on a an ad, ad, as needed basis, um, that will give you um, a network and an opportunity to meet people, and you never know what other opportunities will come from that. 
so that's a few uh, points for me from um, experience. Um, I'm very glad that you chose to spend um, the afternoon um, with me. If you've enjoyed it, if you found it useful, please tell everyone. Um, if you've got feedback for me, um, give me positive feedback makes me happy um if you if you've got some other points you want to make or things that you think we should include in future iterations please also um let me know please tell your friends other people who are resettling to register for the next one um february and then may um the dates and the details are on the website and also on eventbrite where the registration details will be um so um unless anyone's got any further points. Um, thank you very much for spending the afternoon with me. Thank you so much to all the wonderful presenters. This will end up um, in bite-sized chunks um, on YouTube um, and accessible from the website. That may take me a few days to do what is a bit of a marathon editing job. Thank you very much. Um, good luck to all of you um, in your career searches. And if I can help, um, please do get back in touch with me. Good evening.